Okay, guys, we're going to we're going to kick it off and then go to closed session. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the February 12th, 2024 special meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we have a roll call? Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. Here. Mayor Uring. Here. You have a quorum with Mayor Pro Tem Stewart absent. Cool. Uh, Paul, could you lead us in the, the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd be delighted to. Huh? I don't think we did that. I didn't think we did either. Apparently we do. <laughs> special meeting, not at the beginning of the meeting. Well, this is a special Pledge of Allegiance. Are we ready? Yeah. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can we get a note on the posting, a report posting the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 9th, 2024. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Uh, if there's no objection, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So ordered. Aye. Uh, we'll, now remove, we'll now move to closed session. I discussed the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll return. Mayor? Yes. Would you like to hear if there's any public comment first? I would, yes. I should do that, yes. Is there any public comment? I have not received any speaker slips, and we do not have any participants or raised hands in Zoom. Kel Kel Kelsey, that's why you're here. You're good. Thank you. I will now recess to closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll return to the open session for a closed session report before the meeting adjourned. Before we do that, uh, Mr. Mayor, I yeah. believe Councilmember Silverstein is going to recuse himself from one of the items. Yes, I'm going to recuse myself from the Riddick item, and I'll ask that we hopefully do that one second so I can get started with the meeting and then we'll get out and come back at 630. Works for me. Okay, cool. Off to closed session, guys.
Okay, we ready? Kelsey, we're on. All right, thank you very good evening, everybody. Uh, before we start, can we have a closed session report, please, Trevor? Yes, Mr. Mayor. At approximately 4.30 p.m., the City Council met an open session and then recessed to closed uh, yeah. session for the items listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present. Council ah, Member Silver cool. Council Member Silverstein um, uh, recused himself from the item relating to um, the Jason Riddick versus City of Malibu matter. No reportable action was taken on the first closed session item, and this was the uh, significant exposures litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D2, uh, the communication from California Department of Housing and Community Development regarding noncompliance with housing element deadlines. On the second item, the matter of Jason Riddick versus the City of Malibu was listed on the posted agenda. The City Council, um, by unanimous decision, um, has authorized the City Attorney's Office to file a request for review from the California Supreme Court of the decision of the, Apple, the appellate court in that matter. And again, Councilmember Silverstein was recused and not part of that discussion. February 12, 2024, regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk to my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Mayor, before you open the, uh, the regular meeting, just want to confirm that you did adjourn the, close, the special meeting closed session. Yes, okay. I did. Councilmember Grisanti? Present. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Yearing? Here. You have a quorum. Lester, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. It's my pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lester, thank you very much. Kelsey, can I get a report on posting the agenda, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 2nd, 2024, with the amended agenda posted on February 9th, 2024. Thank you, Kelsey. We need a motion to approve the agenda. Anybody? I'll make a motion we approve the agenda. Second. Second. Okay, if there's no objection. I'd need... like to make an amendment. Go ahead. Can we um, adjourn in the memory of Matt Rath? Yes. Definitely accept that, sir. No problem. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so ordered. And now let's move on to written and oral communications. We have no presentations this evening, I'm aware of. So written and oral communication from the public. Thank you very much. Lester, you're going to be up first. Followed by Fireball, you're up second, you're sitting in front. And Jill Hawkins, you're going to be third. So as long as you're near the front here, that'd be great. Do we have any hands for speakers? There's one raised hand. Okay, cool. Thank you. Lester, you're on. Hi, everybody. It's been a long time since I've <clears throat> been here. I, I like the Zoom action. But I, I felt it was important that I, that I showed up in person. <clears throat> um, I'm basically here to tell you that the million dollars you spent last year and the 10 to 13 planners that we hired to flood the zone to open up the log jam didn't work. Um, personal experience, professional experience, I've got a CDP amendment on Boniface submitted May 5th, 2023. I have all my agency approvals. I have no complete letter. I've never received a planning letter. My planner says he has 50 projects on his desk. I got a CDP clean sheets on Zoomeris, piece of cake review, submitted 8-24-23. Two months later, I received a letter from, from my planner saying that we'd have the initial uh, planning letter done in two weeks, waited three months to get that letter. We turned it back around in two weeks. I have all my agency approvals, but I have no idea when I'm going to get my, my next review letter. 
I have a project on the west end of town. No new square footage. Interior structural remodel, but it doesn't matter because we're talking planning. Submitted 10, 12, 23. Took me three months for no new square footage to get an NOD to go to a supervisor on 111, this of Jan January 11th. I haven't heard from the supervisor. The Malibu Country Inn, we all remember that project. It was the one where the planning department said you could tear down a non-conforming thing and rebuild it back in place and uproar, got thrown out. Got In the meantime, um, I came on board. My client received a letter from the city saying you have to tear down the sunroom because it was never permitted. We're like, okay, we'll tear it down. They say submit, a, they say, submit a, a, an application. We submitted the application June 8th to demo a sunroom that the city told us to do. We weren't fighting anything. It, at, a week ago, it finally went to a supervisor for what is called my first round review, okay? Now, so I'm telling you, this didn't work. I'm not saying it was a bad idea, it didn't work. Now, the city manager will tell you that that wasn't what the money was for. He'll tell you it was to keep the status quo, keep, keep things flowing. That's not true, because tied to that were metrics. The metrics were never done. They stopped two months into the year they were supposed to be done. So I, I'm sorry, and I know I'm running out of time, but it's not working. Whoever's running it isn't, isn't doing it right. I need three of you to step up and maybe try to take a little more control over this process and figure out what to do. Plenty of guys on my end of the aisle would love to give you our suggestions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lester. Fire Paul, you're up. Thank you, Council, for your time. Uh, just a quick uh, note. Uh, we gave several of you a proposal for our um, documentary film, 21 Miles of Malibu. And uh, we recently just won another um, film festival, so that makes nine for us, which we're very excited about. But also, uh, we have an event with Lindsay Horvath and Malibu, T Malibu High School coming up May 1st. We were hoping to, uh, to be, maybe get that on the agenda for next time. So I just wanted it as a reminder. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jill Hawkins, is she here? No? Okay, let's go to the hands. Anybody? No, now there's three hands. First is Jamie Francis. Jamie Francis? Yes. Jamie, you're up. Thank you, Council. Good evening. I just wanted to say that I was not aware of your closed session hearing this evening in regards to potential litigation when it came to the housing element. Um, I just was imploring the City Council you know, your predecessors years ago to currently in the last two years, that you had to adopt the housing element, implement it, and make sure that Malibu was for every and all income based on the 1967 Jesse Unruh Act that said that there is fair housing in every community. So much so now that Rob Bonta has to pursue and look at Apple communities like Malibu, La Cunada Flint Ridge, Agora Hills, Westlake Village, and so forth, and other communities in Central and Northern California for not adopting and, and having some kind of implementation and, and knowing that people of all incomes can reside in Malibu without there being an hindrance or an issue. And there you have council members who are sitting on that dais who have been stubborn and reluctant and finding any reason or excuse why not to adopt it. Pass it back to the Planning Commission. Go to and fro, to and fro. What is it about it that affordable housing isn't going to depreciate the values and land? It's only going to be more exclusive, inclusive instead of exclusive. I heard the mayor, the current mayor, when there was that earthquake in Malibu, who said he got to move to Malibu after the earthquake. Why can't other people already live in the county just move into the city limits? You all were afforded that opportunity one way or another. Do you have to be self-made? Do you have to be a millionaire? You have to be well accomplished in order to have a zip code with the, with the Malibu zip code on it. I mean, honestly, you are discriminating and not implementing what the law says you have to do. And now you're finding some avenue of a cop out or to get out of your requirements. I'm sorry, but you failed. Abject failure. You had a decade. And your predecessors are not putting all the blame on you. 
but it comes down to who's sitting at the city council, and it's not what you prefer. It's what the state says. This is the law, and you have to now abide by it. And I'm, it's ridiculous. It really is. I almost missed your special meeting, couldn't even call in, because it was that covert. You thought that I wouldn't notice? Well, I sure did. And I'm upset, and I'm pissed. How dear and what audacity you have. You have to implement what the state says you have to, and no more excuses. And if there's no developers, then the city has to build it. Then you will have to find ways of implementing low, extremely low, moderate, and high income earners all across the board. No more excuses. Get it done. The state says you have to. Point blank period. That is it. You have gone and evaded a law that has been implemented since 50 years ago. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Here. Time's up. Next hand, please. Uh, Ryan. Ryan, you're on. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to mention that the uh, Planning Commission only had four members at its last meeting, and something very important was on the agenda, and that's the wetlands in the Civic Center, the last wetlands that we've got, and it is immediately west of Stewart Ranch Road and north of Civic Center Way. This is a historic wetlands. I've watched it for 40 years, and it is... Uh, not something that should be diminished. And what is inappropriate was that a, a clever consultant for the new purchaser of that wetland wants to obviously propose some development at the north end of it and needs to minimize the wetlands on paper so that it minimizes the ESHA and the buffer zone from the wetland so they have a bigger building pad on the north. Now, I'm going to call the bluff on this one because we've got hundreds of pictures of this wetlands. It's not just all the aerial photography and the studies uh, that the city has conducted itself on this property, but the consultant from wherever he was, San Bernardino, something like that, that the um, developer found, it just went out there and decided he'd map it himself. It, it really totally disregarded the prior historical factual evidence on file within the city. And so I'm a little disappointed that the staff didn't, you know, bring the documents in out of storage to prove it. But that wetland is three times what the developer is proposing of, of less than two acres uh, to be restored. And the project was before the Planning Commission because they got busted for violating the law and, you know, damaging the wetlands. And so it's a code enforcement case. Now, this is not something to be bargained away. I just wanted to let you know about it. I think that this permit should be revoked because of a factual error. And the error came from documents within the city. Um, just be aware of it. I'm sure you can all watch that meeting. But something very bad happened and uh, needs to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next hand, please. Mario Sandoval. Mario, you're on. Out there, Mario? Hi, yes, good evening. I was just unmuting myself. Can you hear me? You're on, yes. Perfect. So my name is Mario Sandoval. I'm a coastal planner with the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, also known as the MRCA. I'm going to be reading a letter into the record that was provided to your city clerk this evening um, with a copy to the city council and the mayor. Dear Mayor Yearing and Malibu City Council members, on January 5th, 2024, the California Coast Commission required that the city of Malibu submit by February 5th, 2024, a confirmation of the city's intent to install standard roadside coastal access signage within its right of way along Broad Beach Road, Malibu Road, and within the Point Doom neighborhood. By March 5th, 2024, the commission requires the city to install such signage in these locations. See the attached January 5th, 2024 commission letter to the city. Commission staff informs us that the city did not contact the commission staff and did not submit its signage confirmation by February 5th, 2024. Please explain why the city has not complied with the commission's directive regarding coastal access signage in Malibu. 
You'll recall that last summer, the city removed public access directional signage in the city's right of way along Broad Beach Road to Lechusa Beach, a public beach and coastal access owned and managed by MRCA. The city's removal of or refusal to install directional signage in a substantial barrier to public coastal access to the Malibu coastline and is in violation of the city's responsibilities under the local coastal program and the Coastal Act. Additionally, MRCA requests special notice of any city meeting concerning city directional signage to coastal resources along Broad Beach Road, Malibu Road, and within the Point Dune neighborhood. Pursuant to the California Public Records Act, MRCA requests all the city's public records from January 1st, 2020 through February 12th, 2024, that pertain in any matter to the city's lack of or installation of direction signage to coastal resources along Broad Beach Road, Malibu Road, and within the Point Dune neighborhood, including but not limited to the city's response to the Coastal Commission's January 5th, 2024 letter to the city. Please contact with any questions or comments to the MRCA's Coastal Project Special Counsel, Elena Ager. She can be reached at elena.eger at mrca.ca.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Anybody else? Those all the raised hands. Okay. We will close public comment. You make sense. Close public comment. Bring it back up to the council table. Uh, city manager. Mr. Mayor, we have a one commissioner update first. Oh, Fireball, you're going to do a commissioner update? Yes. Please do. I'm very grateful I brought my glasses this time. Uh, good evening, Mayor Uring and the member of, of the council. I am Fireball Tim Lawrence, chairman of the Malibu Arts Commission. Uh, tonight I'll provide you with an update regarding the Malibu Arts Commission activities and upcoming events. Uh, our new poet laureate, Nathan Hassel, has led various uh, poetry programs for children and adults since starting his term in September. Uh, this Saturday, uh, February 17th at 11 a.m., Mr. Hassel and will host a caffeinated verse at the Malibu Library. Kim Dower is the featured reader, and the program will conclude with an open mic session. On Saturday, February, February 24th at 2 p.m., he'll uh, host a new monthly series called The Ripple Effect at Malibu Bluffs Park, my, my Michael Landon Center. This program is a poetry writing workshop open to all levels. These events are free to attend, and RSVP is not required. Through the city's arts and education program, the Poet Laureate Committee has coordinated four week sessions of poetry writing workshops at nearly all Malibu public schools. The workshops teach children the basics of poetry, structure, and types of poems. These workshops culminate with the annual student poetry anthology available this June. Schools visited include uh, Malibu Elementary, Webster, Malibu Middle School, distance learning classrooms. Uh, Malibu High School workshops will take place in March. Uh, art exhibitions. Uh, the Malibu Student Art Exhibit uh, just outside it opened last Monday and ends with a closing reception on Sunday, March 10th at 11 a.m. This exhibition includes over 90 pieces of artwork from students ranging from uh, grade TK, transitional kindergarten to 12. I, I recommend that you stop and take a look at those. On Sunday, March 24th, the Commission will open uh, our next ex exhibition featuring visual artist Leigh McCloskey. The event uh, begins at noon here at City Hall, and we also just confirmed another show with Pep Williams, which uh, uh, Mr. Xanti will enjoy. Uh, art Talks, uh, the commission plans to continue its new Art Talk program. Uh, thank you for attending that, by the way. Uh, art Talks in 2024 will include Pep Williams. The partnership program with Santa Monica College Malibu Campus features conversations with local artists. Programs are free to attend and will take place in the lecture hall at SMC Malibu Campus. And that's my update. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Now we're up to the council table. Manager, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Happy to give my report. Um, so as you know, we got hit with uh, quite a storm uh, last week. Uh, fortunately, we did not uh, encounter any significant issues. We did have some minor issues with uh, flooded roads in addition uh, the city is closely monitoring um, 34 parcels that have some indications of slope failure um, or uh, coastal erosion issues. Uh, we'll be keeping a close eye on, on all, all those uh, and everything else in the city as we're anticipating another significant storm to come through this weekend, which could bring uh, several more inches of rain. 
I also wanted to report that um, the CHP is uh, actively functioning on uh, Pacific Coast Highway. Happy to share some of the latest statistics. And again, these are just for the California Highway Patrol. Uh, Sergeant Sarderland is also here and he can speak to the efforts of the Sheriff's Department. Uh, but this CHP task force for January 29th through February 11th, um, the task force members wrote a total of 154 citations with several of those during the days of heavy rainfall. Uh, not surprising, 151 of those citations were for speeding. Uh, three were for other primary uh, factors. Uh, eight were for equipment violations and uh, 10 verbal warnings for speed were also given. Uh, a couple of uh, interesting points to note, um, a 100 mile per hour violator was stopped and subsequently arrested for driving under the influence. And also on the afternoon of February 8th, uh, multiple non-Malibu task force members were deployed in Malibu for a targeted enforcement. Uh, this resulted in additional 23 moving uh, violations and 16 non-moving violations. Uh, that, was, that work was done in addition uh, to the task force work that's being provided to the city uh, and will not be actually billed to the city, so uh, we're happy to have that additional coverage. Uh, for those who didn't catch it, um, we did have the, uh, recently had the city's homeless count. Um, Wednesday, January 24th, the city participated in the 2024 Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count, along with the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, LASA, and community volunteers. A local count showed 51 persons experiencing homelessness in Malibu. That's the lowest number uh, since 2016 when the city began participating in the homeless count and a 30% decline from last year. I also wanted to note that uh, uh, Malibu's minimum wage is going up starting July 1st, 2024. It uh, will rise to 17.27 per hour. Uh, this is in accordance with the city's minimum wage ordinance. Uh, this increase is uh, calculated annually uh, and requires that the minimum wage in Malibu increase every year on July 1st based on the consumer price index increase. More information on that can be found on the city's website. Um, businesses in town are required to display the poster indicating the city's uh, minimum wage. And some good news coming from the city's community services department. Uh, we're inviting children to join the new Agents of Discovery, an augmented reality program, uh, which promotes environmental education and encourages exploration of Malibu's beautiful natural habitats. Uh, we have a mobile app guides kids ages four to 12 on a mission uh, through Malibu's beautiful legacy park to learn about native plants, insects, animals, and birds. The mission starts at Malibu Library and has 11 challenges, such as finding and identifying plants and animals and answering trivia questions. Children who complete the mission will get a free Malibu Agents of Discovery badge at the Malibu Library. Uh, to get started, download the mobile app, on, uh, and uh, which you can get on Google Play or the Apple Store. Click on Legacy Park Mission, and the city's Great Blue Heron will guide the user through the challenges. For more information about the Agents of Discovery program, uh, please, please visit the city's website. I also want to report that last, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I attended a meeting of our library uh, subcommittee. Also attended uh, the monthly meeting of the business roundtable. And uh, last week, I attended the annual city, manual, city manager conference for the League of California Cities. And I was also joined by Assistant City Manager Joe Tony and Deputy City Manager Alexis Brown. Uh, that's the extent of my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And uh, Sergeant Sutherland uh, from the Sheriff's Department is also here. Uh, to give a report as well. City Manager, thank you very much. Thank you. Sergeant, good to see you again. Likewise. Good evening, everybody. How are we all doing tonight? Doing good. Everyone enjoy the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, uh, a couple items to talk about. Um, first of all, the uh, rainstorm we had, which uh, Steve McClary talked about, there were no significant issues um, in Malibu. Um, the only two issues we responded to was a landslide on Via Escondido, which is all on private property. Um, so it's the homeowner's responsibility. And then also um, some mud came down on PCH near Corral Canyon. I'm sure you've driven by it. Um, so Caltrans was Johnny on the spot there to clean it up and, and uh, get it safe for the uh, motorists driving by. Um, also, we had an earthquake last week. Uh, and the epicenter was off Decker Canyon uh, in Malibu. And 
when earthquakes occur um, that can be felt, us as the sheriff's department, we, initi we immediately initiate, uh, they're called critical facilities checks. So we have a whole list of critical infrastructure that we go inspect to make sure there's no damage. So we did that immediately and we found that there was no damage to report and there was no uh, injuries reported as well. So that was good news. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, the CHP contract started last week and you're gonna see the CHP officers out there. They have seven days a week coverage out there. So you will see somebody every day out there. Um, and also thank you for those LIDAR guns that were issued to them. So they're out there using those as well as we issued them a Sheriff's Department radio so they can immediately get a hold of us if they need backup or if they need help with anything out there on the road. So um, <clears throat> there's two other uh, incidents I wanna report to you on and it seems like PCH and Big Rock was the uh, hot spot for January. So uh, in one of the incidents, uh, the DEA was serving a search warrant at a residence on PCH near Big Rock and uh, one of their suspects ran from them and so they called us to assist them. And we had the, uh, the area shut down while the DEA conducted a search for the suspect. Uh, they were able to apprehend three out of the four suspects that they were looking for and I wish I could give you details on uh, what was discovered in the search warrant, but I can't. But I will say it was a very successful search warrant. Uh, hopefully in the future, they'll give me permission to tell you what they found. Uh, finally, the other incident at PCH in Big Rock um, involved the Malibu crime suppression deputies uh, that were working the afternoon car that the city pays for. They uh, had been doing investigation on vehicle burglaries that had been occurring in Malibu, and they identified two vehicles that, which were associated with those vehicle burglaries. And so, go backwards a day before that, there was vehicle burglaries which occurred at Topanga Beach, which they went and assisted with. And while the deputies were responding there, one of those lookout vehicles uh, took off and fled from the deputies. Well, they were able to get that license plate. And so the crime suppression deputies, they went to the registered owner's address in Santa Monica, and it turned out to be an elderly gentleman who had no clue that his license plate had been stolen off of his Audi. And so they took a report for that and entered that license plate into our database as stolen. So fast forward to the day of the incident, they were driving around the area and spotted the car with the stolen license plate on it. So they got behind the car and the car went up Big Rock Drive. Uh, they tried to pull it over and the car made a U-turn and then rammed the deputy's patrol car to try to get away. And so the car came back down Big Rock towards PCH, fleeing at a high rate of speed and crashed into an innocent civilian driving by. Fortunately, nobody was seriously hurt um, and they were able to arrest the two suspects inside the fleeing vehicle. Um, the passenger in that vehicle had a loaded firearm, a firearm on him. So we got those two guys off the street. So they were doing outstanding work out there. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I have to report on is our crime statistics for the month of January. So we had 35 part one crimes, which compares to 44 for last January of 2023. So percentage-wise, that's a 20.5% drop month over month for the same time last year. So that's good to see. It continues the downtrend. Um, there were two significant incidents in the month other than what I reported on. Uh, there were two residential burglaries, both in the, both in the Malibu West um, area. One was on Tapia Drive, uh, where entry was made through the shattered master bedroom door and uh, some items were stolen, and then there was another one on La Gloria Drive, which is the, uh, down the street, same MO, entry was made through the exterior master bedroom door, and some items were stolen there. Um, I am next week, next Wednesday, on the 21st at 7 p.m., I'm going to be talking to the Malibu West HOA uh, at their, their uh, monthly meeting, which is at the Malibu West Beach Club, and we're going to be talking about burglaries and things to look for and things to keep your home safe. So everyone's welcome to attend. So that's 7 p.m. on the 21st. And that concludes my report. Sergeant, thank you very, very much. Any questions?
Anybody? No? I think the only good news of the storms was it slowed the traffic down on PCH. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did better than we could do. All right, thank you very, very All right, much. Thank you. All right, let's bring it back up to the commission table, city council comments. Who wants to go first? I have a couple questions with the city right manager. Um, regarding MRCA's comments with the signage, I think I'm a little confused by that. I, it was my understanding they were supposed to put in applications for signage, but it sounds like they're expecting us to do. I, I have to, uh, I, I'm just reading the letter for the first time this evening. Um, I did read through it. There were some uh, suggested dates that they wanted to hear back from the city. Um, so we need to take a look at that and get back to them. Uh, but I'm not aware of anything that we were, any terms of statutory deadlines or anything that we, we missed here um, or, or not providing information to them in a timely manner. But we'll certainly look into the letter and um, we'll provide a response back to MRCA and uh, we'll bring the council up to speed as well. But I'll need to look into it a little bit further. Okay. Um, and then regarding uh, Mr. Tobias's comments for the planning updates, uh, do we have anything set on the schedule to give council an update on metrics and success of planning improvements uh, based upon the increased? Um, we didn't have anything scheduled, but we could certainly put something together, uh, a report to council. In fact, we we're working on along, something on that along those lines. So. Um, we could certainly put together a, a summation of uh, what we've been doing over the past year, um, the work that, that, that the contract planners have been doing, um, and as well as an analysis of kind of where we're at in terms of trying to address the, uh, the workload and, and the overall staffing levels. Um, so we'd be happy to put a report together and provide that to council. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? That those are my questions. Well, Paul, you want to go? I'll start like like uh, most of us, we're, we're all very happy when we have uh, two free weeks between meetings, and I was able to use it with a lot of reports that came out. Most recently, we got a, uh, I, I learned, we all did, because Hans sent us out, Hans Letts, on the, the fellow with the radio program, sent us copies of a Department of Transportation new rule dated January the 16th, which seems to be a new design information bulletin that tells us about uh, the kind of studies they are expecting us to and they to do anytime there's any work to be done on PCH or any other, any other uh, highway in, uh, in the state. And it looks like they're in favor, they, this new rule is in favor of us making the kind of area speed limits based on residences or based on businesses. And that we now have an, a rule that supports our desire to lower speed limits in business areas and residential areas. And it's a, it's a large thing, it's 80 some pages and I printed it out today. I haven't read it all, I've only glanced through it, but everybody should have gotten this in their email uh, today or yesterday. So that was, that's, looks hopeful. Uh, the County of Los Angeles has a coastal resilience study and they're gonna have a Zoom on it on Wednesday the 28th at three o'clock. And so a lot of people can go ahead and, and uh, participate in it. Uh, glancing through this, this is talking mostly about the project that was put forward to, to uh, what they're trying to do is mediate, mitigate the effects of sea level rise on the public beaches that uh, we depend on for people to recreate on. And so it's, uh, it's interesting, it's uh, very much on point. And they're, what they're looking to do is put in a network of offshore, under, offshore reefs and then do uh, sand replenishment. And that's, that's interesting. It's nothing that would be visible from anywhere unless you're diving. And it also adds habitat for, for the sea creatures. We also, during this last few weeks, have received the draft 
of the state of California's sea level rise guidance. This is a 2024 science and policy update, and this will, it's uh, about 97 pages, and this will act to change what the city of Malibu has put forward a, a first run at. And so it's going to influence what we do. And basically what they're telling us is what they thought was probably going to happen by the end of the century, probably won't happen until 2150, which is better than nothing. But they also said very prominently in here that we think our predictions for what's going to happen by 2050 are pretty, pretty high likelihood of happening. But beyond that, we don't know if there's going to be an acceleration or not. And that's, you know, as time is going on, we're getting better and better projections. And I think that, that the science is progressing. So I would urge anybody who's interested to get involved with those. The other things, there is a, uh, the Topanga Beach Lagoon restoration project seems to be moving forward and I we're not probably going to see anything happen because they're going to replace that bridge and everything down there and turn it from something that's 74 feet long to 150 feet long but that's uh they're going to got a meeting on that at the end of the month as well and they're going to do outreach in in uh, the Topanga area and also down in the Annenberg Center in uh, Santa Monica and then like a lot of us, we all, many of us, I know Marianne and I at least, both went to the CVRA hearing that was held here in Malibu. And this is about uh, changing the way the votes are done for Santa Monica Malibu Unified School Districts. And then I went uh, this last weekend down to Santa Monica to watch the Santa Monica opponents of the change. And it was pretty much of a wake up call about uh, how the people feel about us. So I'm looking forward to some sort of resolution on that. And the school separation thing seems to be progressing a little less speedy than we would hope for, but we're working on it. And the other thing I want to do, I want to put in a plug for the Harry Borowski Youth Council. Uh, it's uh, if you have kids in school, uh, we want them to Think about if you want them to join a deliberative body that's set up to help your kids get used to the idea that they too can participate in government. And it's, uh, it's been very important to some of the people I've recommended in the past. They got on the Youth Council. One of them was, is working in Washington now. So it's worth doing. It's a great enhancement when they're applying to college that they did something like that. And I believe that the, uh, the request for new people ends in beginning of March. So by all means, uh, I think Kristen is responsible for that. And I may have even gotten it roughly correct. Good, she's waving her head yes. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Paul, Marianne. And my daughter was a youth commissioner and she got a lot of great uh, experience out of that. So I highly recommend the program. Um, so I attended a um, CPA board meeting, and CPA is where they are a uh, community aggregate where they um, go out and find green power, and that is how our power is delivered to us is through green means, so solar, wind, um, hydro, and uh, the CPA that we are part of is actually the largest one, I believe, in the country, not just the state. So they're doing a lot of great work out there, making sure that we have clean energy provided to our residents in our city. Um, I attended a library subcommittee meeting where we uh, reviewed the timeline and the budget for um, items. I'm sure Bruce will talk about that also. Um, as Paul said, attended the C of ER Harry A hearing in person here in Malibu and virtually in um, the one that was held in Santa Monica. A lot of very interesting um, things that were said about the city of Malibu and our residents here. I encourage everyone to get involved. Um, the, I just want to announce on Wednesday, the Port Doom, Point Doom Headlands will be having their monthly uh, cleanup. 
and weed pulling event. So in honor of Valentine's Day, I encourage everybody to go out there, 9 to 12. I encourage you to carpool. There is very limited parking, um, and you can utilize Westward Beach parking lot and just take a um, quick little hike up the, the headlands there to be able to meet the group. Um, and you can find more information about that online through Nextdoor. Um, I also wanted to announce that on the 21st, we have our next library speaker series, and um, we have a female firefighter, I believe. Um, so I think that's going to be, and that's going to be held at the library. Um, so um, information about that is available on our website. You can go to the calendar, just look at events, and you can see all the information and to RSVP and to get um, additional information about the speaker. Highly recommend everybody attend those events. There are a lot of interesting information. Uh, the city's holding an organics recycling training and kitchen cutting caddy giveaway again on the 14th. Um, there is an e-waste cleanup here on the 17th. So if you've got e-waste that you need to get rid of, paints, things like that, it's a time for everybody to take care of that. And I talked about that, I talked about that. That is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Bruce? Okay, thank you. Um, so first I want to thank the public speakers and the people who submitted written comments. Um, we all read them and um, take them into account whether we address them or not. At least I do. I know I can speak for myself and I, I think the others do as well. Um, I'll address some of the public comments and I have some other comments I was going to make before hearing the public comments. Uh, Lester, um, bureaucracy sucks. And um, separate and apart from that, I, I am constantly receiving calls and, and uh, emails from residents who um, believe that there is something amiss in the system aside from bureaucracy and, um, and perhaps sometimes people that don't know what they're doing. Um, there's constantly people who believe that it's not what you're doing but who you know in the city that gets things done. And um, I have been, since elected, looking out for that and, and don't see it, but I hear it over and over and over and over and over again from residents. Um, and, uh, you know, reality is important, but perception is important also. And, and to the extent that there's any overlap between those, that's, that's critically important to understand and get to the bottom of. So um, I just want to encourage members of the public, again, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe you're being, uh, not getting approvals you ought to be getting, other people are getting approvals they ought not to be getting, Bring them to our attention, certainly bring them to my attention, because I do care about them and I do look into them. Um, I've yet to see a situation where I concluded that it was anything other than reasonable decisions that were being made, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. But um, please, you know, we're only as good as the information we receive on that. But clearly, the, the red tape needs to be cut through somehow better. Um, the gentleman who was on the line, Jamie, I mean, first of all, obviously, nothing covert is happening with the, um, the housing element. We had a public hearing about it a few weeks ago. Um, the, hearing, the, the special session today was, pub, was public, published, as it must be, in a published agenda. So nothing secretive is going on. Uh, there's a saying in litigation, if you have the facts on your side, pound the facts. If you have the law on your side, pound the law. And if you have neither the law nor the facts, pound the table. And I think that that gentleman's calls and comments that he makes repeatedly in Malibu are pounding the table. He understands neither the facts nor the law. His understanding of the facts is off, as, ev as evidenced by his latest comment about the fact that we're covertly operating here and his belief as to how the law works that we're required to build affordable housing as a city um, is also completely off base. And he, if he's going to keep calling in with those comments, he really ought to study what the law really is, and he should look at what work we're actually doing to try to make affordable housing available in Malibu. Um, you know, he's somebody who, for some reason, has not been able to get what he wants, so he just screams, and um, it's not helpful. Uh, Ryan commented about the wetlands um, on the Smith property. Um, there was a hearing before the Planning Commission. A modified version of what was requested, I understand, was approved. Um, I am hopeful that somebody will bring that to the City Council so that we can take a look at it, 
not, not that we have any preconceived notions of what ought to happen there, but I think that it's an important enough matter that it deserves a look by the city council, and I'm hopeful that somebody will bring it to us. We have, as I understand, the ability to appeal decisions if we believe they ought to be appealed. Um, but the way it works is um, planning commission makes a decision. If the city council wants to take an appeal, the city council has to approve that act within 10 days because that's the jurisdictional time limit for an appeal. And we can't get it on an agenda and have a meeting within that period of time. So it's kind of a meaningless provision in our law. I'm hoping somebody could take a look at that and either provide for a longer period of time if the city council wants to take an appeal for that to occur so that the proper processes can be followed, or perhaps, and this is not just this matter, this is in general, or perhaps there could be a delay in the uh, approval that is granted by the planning commission it's taking effect so that there would be time in between for there to be a city council meeting, any decision as to whether to take an appeal. Um, perhaps it could even be agendized each week that um, any decision is subject to being voted on for an appeal because we can't even decide whether to, to take an appeal unless we first put it on an agenda and the agenda doesn't come out in time. So what would happen is we'd have to, a week after the um, planning commission meeting, we'd have to have a consensus to put it on the next agenda, at which time it's, the, the appeal period's already passed. So I think something should be done about that. It's, it's kind of a, it's a rule without a uh, meaning. Um, I am interested also in learning more about this Coastal Commission, MRCA, public access sign issue, so Opal. I'd like to get a letter, a copy of the letter. I think we should all see a copy of the letter that, not only from the MRCA, but the letter that he was referring to, and maybe it's attached to the letter. Um, great that we, that we weathered the storm and the earthquake, um, you know, quite a lot of nature going on. It's almost a repeat, a repeat of the hurricane we had last year, but uh, that, that that was, I haven't been in Malibu as long as many people. That was the worst earthquake I've experienced. Hopefully it'll be the worst I've experienced, I experienced, but I understand from people who've lived here for a long, long time that they hadn't felt one here like that, perhaps other, since um, Northridge. Um, I, oh, I also, I attended the ANF, an ANF committee meeting. I attended the library committee meeting that Mary Ann mentioned. Um, I read with, 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 um, great surprise and, and, and hope that our homeless count's been finished. We have 51 homeless people or people experiencing temp temporary um, homelessness or whatever the term is you're supposed to use these days, but 51 people, and that included a large number in vehicles. Um, when I ran for council, one of my campaign platforms was to work on reducing homelessness in Malibu. And, and you know, I am perhaps an outlier. My view wasn't I want to reduce it for the sake of the people who are homeless, although clearly that's a, that's a viable and valid objection objective, um, but I wanted to reduce it for the safety of the community who were um, feeling threatened, if not actually being threatened, by a large number of people living unhoused in the city. Um, in the 2016 to 2020 time period before Stephen and Paul and I were elected, um, homelessness count in Malibu rose from 161 to 239. That's a substantial increase. The numbers objectively don't sound that high when you compare them to Los Angeles, but for a small town, that was a substantial increase. Um, since that time, since the election in 2020, we went from 239 to 157 to 81 to 71 to 51, a constant decline year after year. Um, when we were elected, it had constantly been said over and over again, Martin versus Boise prohibits the city from doing anything about it. And as a resident, I kept saying to the city council, you're wrong, stop saying that, it's not true. Well, it's not true, and on, on top of that, I think that the U.S. Supreme Court is likely to reverse Martin versus Boise in the current term. But there are things that can be done, and I pressed, and, and I had these assistants, uh, um, Mikey Pearson and I worked together on this, and we had a unanimous council. We adopted a no camping ordinance that was different than the one that had been on the books for years, and which was tailored to Martin versus Boise on the assumption that it's correct. And I believe that that has had a substantial influence in the downward trajectory, because Homelessness is not going down, for the most part, in, the, in, in, in Los Angeles County, in California, and generally, but it is here. And again, we don't, I've said this many times before, we don't have Malibu homeless. We have people who have come to Malibu homeless and chose to live in Malibu homeless. This is unlike other cities where someone loses their home that they live in and they're, they're outside now on the street. That's not happening in Malibu. Um, as I've said at the last couple meetings, 
I believe our count could be even lower if we actually were to aggressively um, enforce the law that we carefully adopted. At a bare minimum, it can be applied to the people who are living in vehicles because there's nothing in Martin versus Boise that protects people living in a vehicle. They have the ability to go find shelter. They're not, they don't, they're not limited to being on foot to having to go find a shelter. They can get in their vehicle that they're living in and drive to a shelter. If there's not one within 20 or 30 miles, there's one within 50 or 60 miles. They can go find it. So I'm, I'm very pleased that the tra trajectory, I'd like to see even more done there. Um, the last comment I'll make is that we received a slew of letters or emails about the decision we made on the um, half marathon. Um, I think that's the one it is. Uh, that was awarded to Malibu Moves. There's an effort to appeal that decision. As I understand it, there's no such thing as an appeal of a decision of that sort. Um, and I, I don't believe this letter writing campaign is a viable or valid use of our time. Um, but it, again, we did read the, I did read the comments. I read every one of them. And um, I've taken them into account in preparing my comments and in thinking about where I stand on various issues. And I assume that's the same for other members of the council. I think we made a proper decision based on a proper review of the information and a public hearing. and. Um, there's always somebody that's not happy with a decision, but we don't reconsider our decisions just because somebody doesn't like them. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Mayor Pro Tem, you're up. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a list of items here that I attended. A and F uh, with Bruce. Uh, school district discussion about forming districts for the uh, uh, current existing uh, Malibu school district. Uh, just so everybody knows, this is not. Um, uh, affecting the separation between our school district and theirs. This is for the unified school district of all the schools, uh, both both ends of the uh, school district. <clears throat> Met with uh, Assembly Member Irwin's entire staff from Sacramento uh, and locally. Uh, all 11 of them were here to meet with uh, city staff. The mayor and I were uh, in that meeting with the city staff. Had a very frank discussion about uh, PCH safety and uh, including speed cameras, CHP, and Caltrans. Uh, we've got uh, strong partners with uh, uh, Assemblymember Irwin and Senator Allen and Horvath, uh, but uh, just because we think it's important, we have to deal with the whole state when you look at uh, things from Sacramento. Uh, I want to compliment the uh, city staff, especially Public Works and Public Safety, for the uh, turnout and coverage that we got during the rainstorm. Um, I think everybody was surprised we didn't have more damage than we did. There were rocks on the roads, but they were gone quickly, and mud on the roads, and you know, thanks to everybody for taking care of that. Uh, the earthquake, uh, you know, we kind of forget that we're an earthquake country, and when you have a big pause, nobody thinks about it very much. And if you've ever been on the East Coast or the South, when hurricanes come through, what's the first thing you see happen on the news? Everybody runs to the hardware store to get water and plywood, you know, hurricanes come every year, and they don't have any of that there. We are fortunate or unfortunate. We know earthquakes can happen any time, and it's no time to go get the bottled water or the supplies that you need or the first aid kit when it starts shaking. I encourage everybody, make sure you got your stuff together and are ready for an earthquake. And if you listen to the people in our public safety department, they'll tell you you need three days, seven days kind of supplies, and I bet most people don't have that, and nobody's going to come to help us. Um, we're, we're on our own if we have a major earthquake in Southern California. There's 10 million people here, and uh, the, the 10,000 residents of Malibu are not going to be high on anybody's list. Um, the other thing I want to mention, uh, the sergeant talked about the uh, license plate that uh, they were seeking from this uh, break-ins on uh, PCH. I want to remind the, the, the staff in Southern California Edison we have had automatic license plate readers approved and they're purchased. They're sitting in a box. And this, it had those been up on the post, would have alerted the fact that this guy is driving or this car is driving through Malibu. That's what they're for. They don't do us any good in the box. Let's get them on the post. Let's get them in business. They've done it in association with the Sheriff's Department. We know these things are valuable. I used the example the other day with the Southern California Edison person. There was a serial killer. Uh, from the Inland Empire that was in Beverly Hills, and as soon as that person drove into the city limits of Beverly Hills, he was on their cameras, on their uh, license plate readers. It's important we get those in place. 
Um, Lester, your comments about the um, planning department, I think, are, are sound. It's unfortunate. We have spent money on trying to make that better. Uh, I've had a conversation with the uh, city manager, not telling anything out of school, and we do want to bring up the report from Baker Tilly, the recommendations, and see how we're doing on that. I know he's working on it. That's, I think, what he was alluding to. We have a roadmap for what the professionals and the uh, knowledgeable people we paid to do that study. Let's go see what the, they recommend and let's see how we're implementing it. I go back to one of the things I've, you've heard me say all the time, you can have ca you need cash, resources, and focus to get a strategic event done. We've got the cash. We spent it, in this case, on Baker Tilly and the staffing. We just have to get the resources together to make it happen, and resources are scarce. So we have to understand, while we may have good intentions, we've got to have the people to be able to implement it. But that's where our job comes in, is to set the priorities and make sure we do the best we can with what we have. Um, Paul, your, your comment from Hans is on the uh, Caltrans report. I haven't had a chance to read it yet either. But Hans made a good point. If anybody that's followed uh, Representative uh, Weiner, or Weiner from uh, San Francisco, he had a list of things he wanted to see Caltrans do. He put together a, a proposed bill. And Hans's comment was his bill has been incorporated even before it's even been processed in Sacramento in this Caltrans study. So I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, I feel like I'm back in college. We get these reading assignments that come across the uh, transom periodically. And um, this is one I was, I was going to read. It's probably going to put us to sleep as we read it, though. Um, Low-income housing. Uh, this person that called in, I agree with Bruce, uh, a lot of mis misconceptions, misinformation there. And uh, it's unfortunate. I hope uh, people realize that uh, just because you say it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And one of the things that is taking resources away from our uh, planning department is all the work we're doing on low-income housing work. So please understand, we're trying to comply with the law. We're trying to do everything we can. And this gets back to my comment about resources. That you, can only, you can only take a gallon of paint and you can't paint the whole house with it. And we're trying our best to cover everything we can. You know, my hats off to the planning staff. Uh, they work, uh, they've got a lot of things on their plate. And uh, it seems like every time we turn around, there's another mandate from uh, Sacramento or somewhere else that we need to address. So please understand we're, we're working diligently on that and their hands are full. On homelessness, um, I've said this before, I think Malibu has a heart and it has a big heart. Uh, in some cases, some of our citizens uh, actually provide lunches for homeless people in the city. And you think, well, that's just going to attract them here. But what you're missing is what I refer to as the ham sandwich theory. And we're working these homeless people one agenda at a time. And I'm not doing it. It's people concern. It's the cog cities with our representative there. It's our own public uh, safety department. Uh, we, we look at these people as one person. It's not one size fits all. They get to know these people first name basis, they work with them, they try and get them back on their feet or get them help or whatever is necessary. And it doesn't happen by just shuffling them off to somewhere else. It happens where you work with them, get them IDs or whatever has to be done. And I think this is the spirit of Malibu, is to be a good citizen, be a helping hand to your neighbor, and that's what we're doing. And that's, a, that's the reason why we've gone from 250 down to 51. And some of these people are uh, service resistant. Uh, Paul and I read the COG City report from the outreach coordinator, and it breaks your heart sometimes when you read these. That you know this, it wasn't uh, last week uh, in Malibu. It was in Agoura Hills. This woman came up to uh, him, the outreach person, and said, "I'm cold. I'm wet. I want help." <coughs> Two days later, she said she didn't want to hear from anybody. It's unfortunate, but that's what we work with. And they're trying to help these people get on their feet. So understand it's not easy. <coughs> and they're, we're working on it very diligently. With that, I'm going to get a drink of water. Over to you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doug. A uh, couple things. I, I hope your comment that says nobody loves us and if we get in a problem, no one will show up uh, is wrong. All right? And just to let you know, in the last two events, the heavy rains that we had, and the earthquake, immediately after both of those, I got a call from Lindsey Horvath. 
asking how what was going on in Malibu, were we safe? So we do have some friends out there that hopefully will show up if we have a disaster and give us a helping hand. So thank you. Um, disasters, I want to congratulate uh, Rob DeBow, who's not here this evening, Susan Duenas, uh Yolanda, for all the work you guys have done. I mean, in, in, look, this thing could have been worse than anything we've experienced in a very, very long time. Yolanda was taking care with her team, looking at the construction sites, making sure they were good. Rob was out taking care of the roadways. So our staff did one hell of a job uh, protecting Malibu during these events. So thank you very, very much for all that effort. Thank you. That was great. Uh, Adamson House. There is an event taking place at the Adamson House at the end of this month, which is free, uh, which will take people through a tour of the Adamson House and a tour of Surfrider Beach there. And that's, yeah, Surfrider Beach. So I encourage you, if you, you know, have never, never been to the Adamson House, I'll tell you, it is an absolute joy. It's a wonderful place. And if you've never been there, this event is free. Uh, give, give the Adamson House a call to give you the details. It is something you should take advantage of because, like I said, it's just a great place to be. Uh, like Doug, I met, we met with uh, Assembly Member Irwin. Uh, and I'll tell you what, Mike, you know, as, as much as we hear about the speed bumps and trying to get speed cameras in, uh, she was very optimistic, okay, in terms of what was going to happen. So we'll, I just hope that she's correct, and we'll keep plugging ahead with that program as, as much as we can. Uh, the, the voting district events that Marianne and Doug spoke, I mean, and Paul spoke about, those are online. So if you want to watch them, they're, they're interesting. I mean, uh, we may not have a whole bunch of friends in Santa Monica, but, you know, it's just the way it goes. Uh, I attended an event last Friday over in Agoura uh, dealing with the Animal Crossing that's being built over the 101. And this was one heck of an event. It was attended by uh, Wade Crowfoot, who's the uh, Secretary of the Interior. Uh, Senator Irwin was there. Uh, Dana Bochco from the, from the Coastal Commission was there. And what it was, you know, the, these Animal Crossings, interesting enough, they're taking place all over the place. They, the meeting took, took us through what was going on in Texas, what was going on in Florida, and it was really put on by two guys who do photographs for the National Geographic of both pumas and mountain lions here in California. And I'll tell you what, the, the interesting part was the amount of work you have to go through to get a picture of a mountain lion is absolutely amazing. You've got to have the patience of Job to sit there and put these cameras up and go back and keep checking them. Uh, the guy that was doing it in Florida had all his cameras set up. He got hit by a hurricane, uh, lost all his cameras. So it can be a very time-consuming and tar or arduous effort, but uh, they, they showed us a movie that they did, and the effort that they took and what they were able to accomplish was absolutely amazing. So if you get a chance to do any of that stuff, please take advantage of it. It was, it was excellent. Uh, I had a meeting in... in Susan Duenas and I and the city manager had a meeting with uh, Captain C2 from the, Sheriff's, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And what we talked about are other, other things that we can, okay, knowing that the speed bumps, the speed cameras are not going to show up tomorrow. Are there things that we can do in the interim to sort of help us deal with some of the issues we've got on PCH for speeding? And Captain C2 and the sergeant were both there and they were excellent in terms of helping us out. Uh, you know, Captain C2 has put some reserve officers, reserve deputies, on the streets to help us out, which we didn't know about. I thought that was a good move. Uh, they, we, they, there are two different types of, of cars that we have in Malibu. And sure, if I may be using the wrong word, so excuse me if I do that. We've got the crime cars, which are the cars he was talking about that are out looking for uh, crime events, and we've got the cars that deal with uh, traffic. And these crime cars, every now and then, you'll see them sitting behind City Hall or someplace in Malibu sitting there, and everybody says, what the hell are they doing? Well, what they're doing is writing up crime reports. Uh, we're lucky because what they do is, opposed to driving back to Lost Hills to get them written there, uh, they write them in the car. It saves us time going back and forth uh, and allows us to keep them active here in Malibu. And we agreed with the sheriff that when they're not sitting there writing up crime reports, she, the sheriff, uh, the captain is going to have them patrolling PCH, at least putting a presence out there of another police car to, again, try and slow down some of these speeders. So I think that was, that was excellent. So I appreciated that. 
Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. I think that's all I got, so thank you all very much. All right, let's go to the consent calendar. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent calendar, adopt the consent calendar. Anybody like to pull anything? I'll second that. Mayor, let's just, let's just check Zoom. We didn't have any speaker slips. No, there's no raised hands in Zoom. Okay. I'll second that motion. Uh, anybody, uh, council want to pull anything? I'd like to pull items 10 and 11. Not for long, but just for quick comments. Okay, so I get approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 10, B10 and B B11. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion. Why don't we just accept that modification? I'll accept that modification. So will I. <laughs> okay. We need a vote. I think we need uh, consensus. Any any objection? I'm going to call for all in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. Any objections? No. So so moved. All right. So let's go to item B10. Let me see why I wanted to pull this. Oh yeah. The the reason I wanted to pull this is because after I read it, and it deals with providing some additional resources to consultants. And Lester's gone, so I need, you know, Sarah just, <laughs> what he was going to comment on is by virtue of the fact something I pulled up last week. Uh, and here's what I remember, okay? Back in November, of 22, November 22nd of 2022, uh, we approved a million dollars to be spent on, well, let me go back. One of the reasons we were having problems holding on to people was staff was because of the workload that we've got on their plate. At that point, I think they were saying there's like they, each one of these planners has got 60 projects, where if you go to other cities, they got maybe 20 or 25. So we were, you know, we were burdening them with a lot of work. So the idea was what we were going to do is take the million bucks and hire 13 consultants. And those 13 consultants were going to help us clear up the backlog of all the projects that had been sitting around for a very long time. Uh, and that was a good idea. Uh, and so what we asked for at that point in time was, in addition to having the consultants do this work, we wanted to see some metrics, some performance metrics. Uh, that said, here's what we're doing, here's how we're getting better, here's what, you know, why we're getting better at it. So we asked to put those on the website, on the city's website. And they stayed up there for like two months. And then somebody agreed to pull them off. So that information you were looking for which should have been available to us in the front end uh, and it has not been and I know that I got a re response back today from the city uh, talking about you know what that million dollars went but I just want to make the, the million dollars was not always spent on consultants we've also spent another five hundred thousand dollars in that budget and there's another six hundred thousand dollars we're talking about in the uh, agenda today so my question is, what the hell went wrong? I mean, who was managing this thing, and when did we find out that the effort of clearing up this backlog was not working? And once we found that it was not working, what did we do about it? Anybody? So, Mr. Mayor, um, as as just to add to the narrative there, um, and I think this has been been noted before by staff. Um, you know, we've had a a large number of, of vacancies. Um, and we're continuing to struggle to get all those positions filled. Um, part of the purpose of bringing in the consultants was to make sure that we didn't fall further behind uh, and that we didn't add even more to the, the workload of the planning staff. The objective, to be sure, was to try to uh, bring those down, um, try to bring those staffing levels down, try to bring the response times up, and try to get caught up. Um, it took time for us to um, find appropriate consultants. Um, we've been challenged in that regard in terms of being able to, to find people who can do the work. Um, there's also a limited capacity out there in terms of consultants who are available to do planning work to the city. Um, and then in addition, um, the, uh, the workload really has not, has not backed off. Of course, we, we didn't anticipate necessarily that the workload would slack off, but or, or slow down, but um, that is what's continuing to drive the, uh, the challenges in, in terms of, of addressing the workload. Um, 
we are re recommending that we continue using the consultants um, because for the reasons that I stated, if, if we don't have their assistance, um, then we would have even even fewer hands to be able to address the work that's that's presently before us. Yeah, I'm not arguing with using consultants. No, my arguing with the intent of what we were trying to do at that point in time. My concern is that it was a good idea, right? Cleaning up that backlog and you know would give us a, give the current staff we have a chance to work on current stuff and uh, deal with one of the major issues I've been hearing from constituents now for years, right? How come it takes me so damn long to get anything done? Uh, I'm just disappointed that that apparently we didn't follow up with it. Apparently we never got that thing accomplished, right? I, I don't think we, did we clean up the backlog? Not to my knowledge. I think what Lester was saying, we talked to the planning staff, they still got 50 different things on their plate. That's not helping us. So again, it was, I thought it was important because it was something that we agreed that we needed to clean up to be able to hold on the staff, right? Keeping that workload in front of them uh, was certainly a distant center for working in Malibu. So I was hoping to get that done uh, and hoping to you know, be able to speed up some of the processing that takes place uh, in our planning department. So I'm just disappointed Disappointed two things. One, it didn't happen. Two, I never heard any action taking place to try and fix it. Uh, and I think that's what we should have done. That's what the management team's supposed to do. If, if, we, if we got a plan and it doesn't work, can we adapt and try something different to try and accomplish the same objective versus just saying, I don't know what the hell's going on. Paul? Steve, today we received a response to various questions that had been asked by members of city council from the city manager. And I believe uh, his second item here addresses what happened pretty clearly. To date, the department has received more applications than it had last year at this time, i.e. Seven, 770 in 2022 versus 829 in 2023. This is an indication that the workload has actually increased but never slowed down, and the funding was not intended to solve the demand, expedite project reviews, or fully catch up, but allow the department to approve staff's responsiveness to submittals, i.e. 230 incomplete letters in 2022 versus 734 in 2023. In addition, a moderate improvement has been seen in the issuance of planning decisions, 600 in 2022 versus 685 in 2023. Lastly, an improvement has been seen in the amount of projects moving through the development projects process, 1,390 in 2022 versus 1,560 in 2023. Of note, and was touched on as a possibility during the Malibu City Council meeting, the fund balance was ultimately not needed due to the ongoing department savings. So I, I think we're making progress is what the response was. And, and we're actually getting more accomplished. We got more accomplished in 2023 than we got accomplished in 2022. So that, that seems like value for money to me. Richard, question for Richard. Richard, the number of, of uh, that went from 770 to 829, did those include over-the-counter permits requests? Yes, I believe it does. Okay. So, you know, I don't know how many of those are in there, but that should have moved pretty quickly. Marianne, you want to say something? I, I just wanted to clarify that this was an additional $600,000. This is an additional $210,000. On no. this particular contract, so I just wanted to make that clarify. No, all I'm saying is we're, we're in addition to the money we spent to clear up the backlog, we're spending money on additional consultants, and I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that we've got the money if that'll help us, but we got to find a way to make it work. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to drag this out, but right after Christmas, I sent you a letter. I had a transcript of a communication between a resident trying to get a permit and the city staff. You read that letter. Okay, I'm not going to repeat it here because it doesn't do anything to help us out, but we got to start making stuff better. I mean, do it, it's the same stuff that we, I've been hearing for years. All right, and so I'm, 
I don't have an answer for us right now, but I think it's something we're going to have to focus on because if we don't make it, if we don't try, if we don't go out of our way to try something different, I don't see it ever changing. So with that, Joe. Yes, Mayor. Uh, thank you for bringing up the topic. We appreciate it. And uh, obviously we're not where we want to be yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but I do want to point out some uh, items that may be a, a bit of a misunderstanding. So when we brought that item forward, uh, we were seeking appropriation back in November of 22. Uh, that was to give us the uh, expenditure authority from your body to potentially hire more consultants, which we did. Um, but that wasn't necessarily additional funds. We, it was the approval for the appropriation. That said, because of our savings, um, it was almost completely offset by the savings and staffing in the department. We never actually had to take anything out of fund balance. In fact, you'll, as you've noticed in our quarterly reports and our year end, our fund balance has continued to grow. So we continue to see a net surplus. So um, we didn't necessarily spend more uh, funds. Um, but as what we clearly discussed in that conversation was that it was a stopgap measure because we were so understaffed and we were falling further and further behind. So it was really meant to try to come in immediately, try to plug the dam as best we could in that moment. Um, we have started to see some improvements. We were uh, keeping up with the metrics. Unfortunately, our staff member, another example of staffing vacancies, our staff member who was keeping up those metrics went out on leave. Um, so we're trying to bring those back up. They will be uh, updated again, and, and um, they are updated now. Great. Um, and so we'll keep those up to date. They're not and on the website, are they? They are on the website, and they were put up on the 9th. Okay, cool. And we're continuing, obviously, to do all the things that we know from the Baker Tilly study, continue to try to drive uh, all those improvements. So it's, it's a long road. We know we're not there yet, um, but we are starting to see some incremental improvements. I just like to get down the road in my lifetime. That's all I'm trying to do, all right? And I'll, I'll, I went back and watched the November 22nd meeting, okay? And it was pretty clear to me and pretty clear in the meeting that followed that, that the, the, that initial million bucks, or 950000 was designed to clear up the backlog that was sitting in the planning department. We had other funds we allocated to consultants to deal with the current stuff. So I'm just, look, again, we are where we are. I just would like to see a little more focus that says, if we say we're gonna do something, let's manage a damn project, and if, if something goes south, let's talk about what we can do to fix it before I, I get a year later, and we haven't accomplished anything. So with that, I'll let it go. Well, I'm sorry, Marianne. So maybe I need to ask a clarifying question here. Have we made any progress on the backlog? Yes, that's a number of the incomplete letters you see is going through those projects and trying to either determine if they can move forward or is it time for the applicant to withdraw the application or resubmit? Okay, and then just a, a comment on Malibu in general. We have a very unique community here. We have to balance the property rights of people seeking to do things to improve their properties or make changes to their properties, along with the environmental and the community concerns with those changes. So it does take our process quite a bit of time to ensure that we're, everybody is following the rules as required. So things don't move as quickly, period, just because of that balance. And I think we need to keep that in mind um, as staff is going through these things, as our residents are showing concerns about projects, that you know a neighbor is concerned about somebody doing a remodel, that's going to delay the review of that particular application. And that happens quite a bit. So um, as we're looking at things to make improvements, we're going to have that balance of community environmental concern along with it. Uh, I just want to do a quick comparison so people realize that, uh, yes, we are probably making progress, but we're not unique in this. Uh, I had a situation where I was involved in in the last uh, 10 days where it was a uh, project in Ontario to reuse a, uh, a parking area for storage. It, the request from the this is for a conditional use permit. They wanted 14 sets of plans, and they said it would take somewhere between nine months to a year and a half to get it approved. And this is for an existing parking lot to be used for another similar service. So it's not just us. It's it's like that all around the, all around California, and you just have to realize that that's part of the territory, and 
we can do better. There's no question about it, but we're not necessarily that far out around. I just bring that up as a uh, sort of a sanity check. Yeah, just two comments that this discussion has um, caused me to think should be made. Uh, first of all, the term incomplete letter, just so everyone understands, because I wouldn't have necessarily understood it before I started studying this stuff. I mean, that, that means that the applicant hasn't done their work. It doesn't mean the city's remiss in anything. It means that whoever is making the application has put in a deficient application. So the fact that there are all these incomplete letters, that getting out incomplete letters actually is progress. It's, it sounds like it's not because the project doesn't move forward, but it is progress because it tells the people who are seeking to accomplish something what they haven't done, that they're required to be done under the law to get their approval. Um, and to follow up on Mary Ann's comment, you know, you know, our vision and our mission in Malibu is not to build buildings. It's to preserve the rural character of the, and the environment. And because of that, it is complex and complicated and difficult to build here by design. And the neighbor's rights and the community's rights need to be taken, and, and nature's rights need to be taken into account, more so than in many other places. So, um, and on top of that, we have many very wealthy residents who are seeking to push the envelope and do what they know they can't accomplish, but they try it anyway. They submit projects that are not approvable, and they fight every single rejection, and they eventually sometimes get approvals of projects that shouldn't even have been proposed, much less approved. So it's not simply, it may not even be mainly the staff, it's largely what's going on with the community in general and the facts of life. So um, none of this surprises me, and no, none of this actually terribly upsets me. Okay. Bruce? Uh, so let's go. Shall we call the question? Call the question. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Every, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So be it. Okay. Uh, let's go to item 11. 11. And the only reason I brought up my item 11, I asked how much the city has been spending on the uh, separation process, the, the consultants. And we spent right now about $940,000 uh, on the separation with the consultants. Just, just keep that number in the back of our mind. I mean, it isn't, it isn't a small amount. We're putting a lot of effort into it. Uh, I just think the residents have to know that we really are committed to trying to get this done. And that number sort of says something about that. So that, that was my whole point. Other than that, I'll call the item and. Well, well, was that having to do with the different? Was no, that, that the Ryland contract? No, this no, was all of it. I, everything. Item 11 was the agreement with the uh, understanding with the Melville Education Fund. We just gave them $300,000, 300, and I just wanted to get an idea of how much other dollars we were spending, just to keep it in perspective. That's what we're doing. Okay, so. I'll call that. Anybody? Can, we, can we just yeah. have a, just a quick question? Yeah. Over what period of time did we spend that nine hundred thousand dollars? It's, it's what I, we spent to date. So I've, yeah, it, I, all five years. Five, five or six yeah. years. I, okay. Actually, I'm, I'm. First of all, item eleven has nothing to do with school separation. This is this has to do right. with aiding right. the, right. the it was public just money schools. Money that we're putting into the schools. Right. right. Well, but this is a completely different concept. This is this is actually providing current aid to the students right. currently. It has nothing to do with separation. In fact, it's arguably because we are not separated that we're spending this money. Right. Um, the nine hundred thousand dollar number. I'm just curious, is that where, what is that? That's that's the consultants. That's the consultants. Okay. So that does, does that include BBK's fees? Yes. Okay. That's 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 all we're in for so far. Because I'm actually surprised it's not higher than that. Okay. Cool. All right. Doug. Well, I think we called the item. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Aye. I'm sorry, Mayor, who made that motion? That was the previous yeah. item, I believe, Mayor Pro. No, that was this one. And Let's who was the again. second? I'll second. Okay, <laughs> I will call them. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Done. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on. New business, school safety assessment. Can we get a staff report, please? Four A. Yeah. The council did provide direction to hear item 6A after the consent calendar at your yes. last meeting. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this evening I'm very pleased to present the school safety assessment uh, results. As you recall, in October 2022, the council uh, gave us approval to go have a contract with Guidepost Solutions to do a comprehensive school safety assessment. 
the project began in December with data collection, stakeholder interviews, et cetera. It was inclusive of all K through 12 public schools. 209 surveys were completed by staff, faculty, students, parents, guardians, et cetera. Um, and a very comprehensive review of the physical security at the different school locations. They looked at things at, during the daytime, at the nighttime. They looked at the current security technologies, visitor procedures. They looked at, you know, the, they did a crime analysis of the area. Um, and with all this, they came up with over 200 recommendations that covered uh, all three school sites. Um, we, the full report, as you can imagine, we can't release the full report because there's a lot of sensitive information in here and we don't want to provide a blueprint for people who may have uh, you know, other ideas. But we did put together an executive summary that is available to anybody who wants to see it. It's on our website for anyone who wants to go to malibucity.org slash public safety. The link to the executive summary is on the first page of our website. Also this evening we have with us here, whoops, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> the, the recommendations of these 200, you know, over 200 recommendations uh, went over access control, visitor management, video surveillance, communications, door hardware, window treatment, signage, fencing, traffic control, and then recommendations on improved policies and procedures. And it really was very comprehensive. Um, I can say everyone who's looked at it was rather impressed with how thorough it was. And so this evening, um, we do have representatives here from the school district. We have Carrie Upton, who's the uh, chief of operations, and Isaac Burgess, who's the executive director of Malibu Schools Pathway. And also from Guidepost Solutions, we have Nick Hayward, in case you have any questions about the methodology of the assessment as well. Um, we met with the school district in December to get a sense of you know, where they're at and where they're going. And at that time, they said that they'd already begun implementing more than 140 of the recommendations. However, this evening, we will get the, the latest update from them. And at this time, joining us from Zoom, I'm thinking, is Carrie Upton available? Hello, this is Carrie Upton. Hey, Carrie, good afternoon. I think uh, Isaac is going to start for us, though. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, evening, uh, Mayor Irving, uh, council members and community. I'm Isaac Burgess, uh, Executive Director for the Malibu Pathway. I want to thank you for allowing Carrie and I to uh, share some information or some updates just in regards to the uh, comprehensive safety assessment report that was conducted uh, for our four Malibu schools by Guidepost Solutions. But I would like to just make sure that the community knows that um, our schools in Malibu, as well as Santa Monica, have to submit comprehensive safety plans each year uh, that have to be board approved. Um, but we also invite input from our community partners as well into this process um, around the safety and security of our of our schools. Um, all of this is in alignment with uh, Ed Code as well, Education Code. Uh, the report and its finding that was conducted by uh, Guidepost has been shared with our uh, superintendent as well as our Board of Education and, and site principals. Uh, I would like to also say that this was a, a collaborative process. Um, as Susan mentioned, um, myself, Carrie, the superintendent, and others, we've met with uh, city manager Steve, as well as Susan, uh, to you know to review the report as well as to discuss the report as well as uh, next steps or its findings. Uh, so what we noticed from uh, the report, uh, it was very detailed, and that it is a useful tool for us as we continue to prioritize safety and security for all of our staff and students in our schools in Malibu. Uh, what we would like more information on, which we share with Steve, city manager, and Susan, 
is around the response time that was listed in the report. And we would like to have further discussion around that with Captain C2 and our team as well, because the response time is there. We need a little more information around that. But in terms of the report in and of itself, it's very comprehensive, very detailed, and it really highlights areas around staff practices that can be addressed as well as improved, as well as facilities improvements as well. I know that our principals have shared with their respective school communities, especially their staff around some of the areas that can be improved upon, whether it's visitors on campus, whether it's just ensuring that doors are closed all the way. So there's some things for our staff practices that the principals have been engaging their respective school communities on, especially their staff that's on campus. Thank you, sir. Corey? Yes. So, Kerry Upton, Chief Operations Officer for the school district. I manage all of the things that are facilities. So, looking at the report, we pulled about 230 work orders that were for the physical improvements. Of those, we've already completed somewhere between 60 and 70 of those. Some of them are going to take much longer to approve due to funding. There are a few of them that I think we had a little bit of a challenge with as far as whether or not and how to approve them. Some of them, like some of the ones particularly around cameras, go against current board direction and policy. So, we're going to have a conversation with our board if they're going to be adjusting our policy on that. Cameras are a relatively sensitive issue for many parents about how they are used. And it runs the gamut from, I want a camera to watch everybody and everything every child does through the entire day to, I don't want my child ever filmed. So, we have a sort of medium policy on that that's much more about perimeter and access security. So, there's about 40 of the comments that were around that that we have to take a look at. There are some things that are in process, but they won't be completed until we complete certain sort of building improvements. Like a number of them will be improved with the Measure M high school construction project that you all have approved. They're in process and that will make those differences. But we are making great strides towards responding to the report and making sure things are properly done. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. I'm sure all the parents are happy to hear the work you're doing and I think that makes them feel a little bit better. Any questions before we go to public comment? No? Okay. Public comment. Jake Lingo, you're up first, followed by Joe Drummond, followed by Dwayne. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council, for taking public comment tonight. My name is Jake Lingo. I'm the parent of Skyler and Duke Lingo, who both attend MES. I'm also the chair of the AMP Security Council. I came to speak to you last year after the incident at the Giddy Museum. Uh, since that time, I sent numerous emails and have been waiting and hoping that the report that was finally delivered would help elevate the topic of campus safety to the place it was on June 13th, 2022, after the horrible tragedy that had taken place in Uvalde. See, at that time, the nation and this community was outraged and disgusted. Our own city council so dismayed that they agendized an item to discuss the lack of security on Malibu school campuses on June 13th and June 28th, 2022. Everyone was in agreement that our schools are too vulnerable. The geography of our 27 mile coastline and lack of local police department made it imperative that we secure our campuses. There were hours of discussion with the public and officer C2. There were passionate voices for and against armed security on campus. Then the next week, the June 28th item read, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein is requesting council support for this item. Gun violence, including mass shootings in public schools, poses a clear and present danger. It is not unreasonable to expect that a temporary program of some sort can be developed that will increase the level of protection beyond the virtually non-existent protection that is currently in place. In the end, the five member council voted unanimously to send two RFPs, one for private security services to start prior to the incoming school year, and another for consulting services to explore the ways to enhance security with or without armed guards. The headline in the Santa Monica Daily Press the next day read, Malibu considering armed school security in wake of Texas school shooting. So we never got a pilot program, we got a report. It does not in any way report address armed security on Malibu school campuses. We've waited almost two years to address, as Mikey Pearson described it, the elephant in the room since I attended school here. 
If you go back and watch those hearings, 50% of the conversation was around armed security. If you read the surveys contained in the school safety report, at least 20 parents discussed armed security on campus, but yet the report does not even discuss it. What is the point of hiring an outside firm to address an issue and leave out the most contentious and important part of the argument? I understand we have a wide range of issues to work on as a city, and I commend the action you have taken on PCH safety, but I'm really discouraged and saddened that somewhere along the way politics infected what was a truly robust effort to address safety at our schools. We're no closer to an answer on this critical issue as we were two years ago. Meaning, in Councilman Silverstein's words, security on campus is still virtually non-existent. And I am, I'm asking for the same protection for our children that is afforded to the city council and every other public institution that has mass gatherings, an armed guard to protect against the evils in this world. So now what do we do? Do we sit back and wait for something traffic to happen or do we take action? The question I will pose to my friends and to you. I leave you with a quote from Amanda Gorman. It takes a monster to kill children. But to watch monsters kill children again and again and do nothing is just, it just isn't insanity, it's inhumanity. So I ask everyone listening here tonight, where is your humanity? Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe, you're up, followed by Dwayne. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to Carrie Upton and to Isaac Burgess. I think they are trying their best. And um, I, I know that when I try to get too into the school, I have a hard time getting in. But I think the we were, I just wanted to bring this up because we just did the Frozen musical at the school. The, this last weekend and the moms were selling tickets and they were doing the concessions. And um, on the thir first night, there was no security guard there. There was just us moms and the gate was wide open and it was, and we were like feeling very vulnerable. And I went inside and I found the security guard watching the show and I'm like, you need to be outside watching the gate and what's going on. So there needs to be some training. I mean, all the perimeters need to be very, uh, even after school during the plays and musicals, I mean, I, I know like swim, everything after school needs to be protected, not just during school hours. And um, so I think that needs to be a priority on their list, like just making sure people can't come in and during a show, like because the gates are wide open, there's nobody there. I mean, when Taylor or AJ are there, I feel safe, but this security guard, I didn't know him. I think there needs to be some serious training and more um, more priority on the security around the school. I don't personally prefer, I don't really want armed guards in, inside the school. I think anything outside the perimeter, not harming our children in any way, not putting our kids in any risk is good. So that's all, thanks. Thank you, Joe. All right, my friend, you're up. Hi. Uh, I'm Dane Scopehammer. I'm the father of two small uh, girls at MES. And uh, I just want to say that it's, it is heartening that SMMUSD is, is making such what seems like progress on assessing the schools and making sure that those uh, facilities are as secure as, as we can make them. Um, but with all of these things, it seems like that takes a long time. And it only takes, you know, a couple of minutes for something really terrible to happen. So I would urge the city to take some steps, uh, including up to and including uh, armed guards on the campus until those security needs are met, and then afterwards assess whether or not they're still necessary. Um, because between now and when those, when those uh, uh, security measures are, are enacted, there's gonna be some time and in between those times is what I'd be most worried about. And even after, I would, I would suggest that due to the geography of Malibu and how spread out this community is, I know how long it can take to get a sheriff's car from one place to another. And that <clears throat> at best, you know, we'd be looking at a, at a good response time of five or six minutes or, uh, you know, a bad response time of 30 minutes. And uh, under those circumstances, all the bad stuff could have already happened. And that, that we, need, we need people that are equipped to handle uh, or at least delay uh, major, major events immediately. And that's why I would be an advocate for 
armed guards. And I, I want to make sure that that um, enters into what you guys consider when you're considering any other security precautions. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Any speakers? Uh There's one raised hand from Ryan. Ryan, go ahead. Uh, yes, I will with the speakers that uh, security on campus is the big question is only the part really identify consultant and the school district and then local response time public safety agents Ryan, you're um, in and any out. on, on uh, needs to be part of of the school district, yeah. like uh, you need a bunch of air conditioning. Play, it's a major. Ryan, going Ryan, 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 you're cutting in and out. We can't. Excuse me. You're cutting in and out. Um, I'm also on. Mute and it didn't work, so I had to join. I can switch to phone. Okay, I'm sorry. The technical. The, uh, Ryan, your phone's unmuted now. The ongoing expense for on-campus security is part of the education budget. The response from off-campus security, which I would, I'm sorry, is sheriff personnel is the issue identified in the report and being worked on for more detail. But the ongoing expense for on-campus security, whether it's armed personnel or unarmed personnel, is part of the school district budget, just like uh, big air conditioners and electrical expenses necessary for the, the schools in the valley because of the climate conditions there. But this is an on-campus school expense that needs to be incorporated into school funding. If schools need more funding, they need to go to the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Those are all raised hands. Okay, thank you. We'll close public comment, bring it up to the council table. Anybody have any comments, questions? Uh, Paul, I do. Paul? Uh, I'd like to just take a moment to address the comments of Mr. Lingo and Mr. Scopehammer. Uh, when Bruce and I were first on this and we were talking very seriously about hiring armed security and things like that, one of the things we received surprised us. It was a letter from teachers saying they, and it was, they were, they represented themselves as representing a large group of Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District teachers, not necessarily Malibu teachers or, or Santa Monica teachers. They, they, I thought, tried pretty hard to make us think that they had talked to a lot of people. Maybe it was only three, but basically they said that that they are that there are teachers who do not feel that they would be safe if there were guns on campus, even in the hands of police officers. And I, I, I am a little taken <laughs> aback by that position as I was then. And I think that, uh, you know, that was our initial focus, trying to get that done as quickly as possible. And Jen C2 was very helpful, and she was aware of the letter as well. But we're going to do the best we can at, right now. And we're also working hard to try and have more sheriff's deputies here in Malibu as soon as we can hire them so that there would be a better chance that some of them would be here all the time and close to the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else? Mayor Pro Tem? Um, yeah, uh, Terry or Isaac, I think one of you made a comment that uh, one of the things that was holding you back on making the recommendations was funding. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because uh, I don't often agree with Ryan, but I think he's right. Uh, this should be in the school budget. But uh, let's find out how big of a, a number we're looking at or what's causing that holdup. Because I, I, I think the last thing I want to do is have uh, God forbid something go wrong and then find out that uh, we could have fixed it if we just uh, made sure the money was available. So if you could uh, reiterate on that, please. 
Uh, I think that the, uh, this is carry ups, and I think the questions uh, are what I mentioned about funding. It's about where we need to make large structural changes to the facilities uh, that, uh, you know, generally in the school district, uh, there are things that are being paid with bond funds. Uh, and we've exhausted most of the measure M bond funds and some of them are buildings that we have to build and other things that are going to be um, require some additional funding. So whenever I spoke about funding, it was not uh, minor operational funding. It was more large capital funding. Now, when it speaks to the, um, you know, response time, uh, uh, security, especially armed security. Uh, first off, the school district uh, cannot have higher armed security like police because we as a school district do not have our own police force. Most small school districts like ours do not have police forces. You see that at, you know, in Long Beach, LAUSD, you see that at Glendale, you see them the large schools, but not generally anything that's our size. Uh, so that's not something we would do. And the idea of private security, uh, absolutely the district has an issue with. Um, in the report, and I would like um, uh, Nick to maybe speak to this, where they did take a look at response time, but what I would like us to do is actually work with Captain C2 and do some drills where we actually really look at what the appropriate and correct response time is at different times, and also how they will collaborate between the sheriff, the CHP, the uh, Beach and Harbor folks, all of the people who might respond because uh, as we saw with Uvalde, one of the difficulties was you had multiple jurisdictions showing up, you know, at the same time and collaborate cooperation was part of the challenge. But maybe Nick can speak to what they discovered in their report. Nick. Hey. Is Nick on uh, standby or where is he? We do have him on Zoom. We're asking him to unmute himself now so he can address yeah. the council. He may be a moment. He's traveling, so he said that if he's going to be called up, he'll have to pull over okay. to speak. So maybe give him a minute. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I guess it's uh, uh, good that we know it's a funding issue for major capital items. Uh, but I will say that, uh, as Paul alluded to, it's not a question of us wanting to hire deputies and uh, not wanting to spend the money. We just can't get the deputies. They're just not there in the staffing. Uh, honestly, if we had a sheriff substation, they'd be closer here. that would be based out of that. Uh, and I don't know if we uh, 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 emphasize it enough, but as the sergeant said, that the CHP officers now have uh, uh, sheriff's department radios. So it would be a combined response if their uh, CHP is anywhere in the area as well. Nick, is, is uh, he available? Nope. All right. I'll, I'll uh, see to someone else now. Okay, Bruce. Okay, thanks. Um, so I have a question, first of all. The, the report, said, our report, not the report from the um, consultant, says, among other things, to protect students and staff, this report is being kept confidential, will not be made available to the public. And you, you referenced that concept. Um, who has received it? Yes. Sorry. Uh, the people who have received it is, of course, your ad hoc committee, uh, myself, Steve McClary, um, the S Isaac and Carrie, and I'll have to ask them who they've shared it with because once I sent it to them, it was up to them to decide who they wanted to share it with. Okay, o other than who they might identify, that's everyone you're aware of? And the district superintendent, I know as well, has received it. Yeah. Okay. Can, we, can um, we find out from... Isaac and or Carrie, who else? Carrie and Isaac, can you comment on that? Can you hear me? This is Isaac, can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah, you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, our principals have access to the uh, report and it was shared with our Board of Education. Okay, so the principals of each of the schools have received the full report? That's correct. Okay, thanks, great, that, that's helpful to know. Um, is th this is for anyone who can answer? Is there a safe and viable way that could be done to provide it to a select group of um, teachers and or um, parents so that they could provide in confidence, you know, people who are, who are paying close attention to what's going on, that they could provide in confidence their comments rather than just be able just receive this executive summary? 
I think I would leave that up to Carrie and Isaac or the superintendent to decide. Uh, but we've discussed this. Uh, this is Carrie Upton. We discussed this, and yes, we could. Uh, uh, we were waiting for this next step because, as as you know, you all ordered the report, so we wanted you to receive it uh, first before we took the, took that direction. It is possible for us to uh, gather both a group of um, a staff members and a potentially a group of parents and share with them sections and parts of the report uh, and sort of have get, you know, gain their comments. That is something that could be done. Okay, so part of what we're being asked tonight to do is to give direction and I'd like to get consensus from the city council to give direction that that that, that be, um, they proceed with that. I, I think that there ought to be at least a select group of teachers who are, you know, speaking for their community as well as parents who could have access to the whole report so that if they, you know, more eyes are better. We don't want too many people to see it for security reasons, I get that, but more eyes can provide more legitimate commentary and I think that's important to get. I'll second that, it's up to Carrie and those guys to make the decision. We're just giving direction, yeah, so. fine. I, I, I'm hoping we'll give that direction. Um, the, you know, the guns is a, it's a hot button topic, um, it, it, much like it is in public in general with Second Amendment people versus um, gun um, limitation people. So I, I respect both sides. I'm not sure what you do about that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, within the schools. Um, I had thought from um, Captain C2, we learned that there was a roving sheriff's um, officer that was going to be driving around and available to the schools to improve response time and to you know, maybe just be looking around. Did I understand that correctly? I believe that was a J team. A member of the J team was going to be spending some time from time to time here. Yeah, is that happening? So the J team, <clears throat> the J team consists of three deputies and one sergeant. And um, there is a deputy that's assigned to the Malibu schools. So they spend their time going between the schools in Malibu. So, is that on a regular basis? Yes, that's their primary responsibility. Okay, great. So that, that's that's good to know about. Um, you know, I read the report when we first received it. I I thought it was very well done. I, I was very impressed, actually, with the detail of all the things that were examined. Um, I didn't come away from it alarmed that there were major gaps. I thought that um, there were a lot of things that could be improved and, it, and the report I hit, the, hit the highlights. Um, to the extent funding is an issue, it shouldn't be because um, no amount of money can compensate for the loss of life, especially our children. So um, if there is anything in there that our consultant believes is important enough that it should be done, um, I'd hate to see the school say that it's not being done for funding reasons because I think they'll be looking at a hell of a lot more liability for not doing things that are being recommended than they'll be saving by not spending the money to protect the students. Um, it has taken a long time. We did start this process in July of 2022. We were hoping that something at least would interim be in place for the 22-23 school year, which passed. We're now coming on the end of the 23-24 school year. Uh, so, you know, we've been fortunate that um, there hasn't been an incident. There's, there's no rhyme or reason to this. It's happening all over the country and nowhere is safer or more dangerous than anywhere else, although you might think it would be. Um, so I, I would encourage also, is it guideline? Is that Guidepost, I'm sorry, guidepost, guidepost yeah. to, um, you know, if I don't know if this is part of our contract, but I would want them to be monitoring what is in fact being done. And if they see something that's not being done that they think ought to have been done to bring it to our attention. Um, we did commission this report. The school district did not. Um, we, you know, we're, we're concerned about students all over the country. We're concerned about students throughout the, Mal the Unified School District, but we're particularly concerned because we're the Malibu City Council with the students who are in Malibu. And if the schools were separated, we'd be spending all the money necessary to make sure that our students in Malibu are safe. We don't have control over that, but we did have the ability to commission this report. And um, I'm hopeful that the Unified School District will take this report seriously and do everything and anything that's necessary to make our children safe. Thanks. Anybody else? Marianne first. Um, 
so I had a couple, uh, I think, a question maybe to either Isaac or Carrie. You said it was a policy uh, with regards to the armed response, whether there was a, a school police force or an armed private security. Is that a policy that can be uh, changed or addressed by the district? Uh, the district uh, will not be having their own private police. That's not something that will that it it, it is not. It's not just policy. It's it's like ed code that would keep uh, keep that from occurring. Uh, I I. I can, Armed police, I mean, uh, armed officers, such as sheriff and any sworn officer, that is something I can generally say the district will welcome. Private security is something that the, the uh, uh, board members and other members of our community, including teachers in, in Malibu, not teachers in Santa Monica, teachers in Malibu, have a very, very serious re reservation against. So if, we, if that was a recommendation from this council, there would need to be much more serious conversation with the school board and conversation with our community moving forward with private armed security. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I do want to say thank you for both the, the city council being proactive about this, getting this report commissioned, the public safety department, our city manager, or the school districts help with this. I think everybody at least brought, came together and brought this forward. So I, I just want to say thank you and make sure I acknowledge that portion. Um, I would like to delve a little bit deeper with the concerns that people are having about armed guards. Um, you know, obviously we would be recommending that these are trained professionals and not just some rent-a-cop that is a mall cop or something like that that these are, are trained professionals to um, be there to protect and ensure that our children are safe. Um, I would encourage everybody to read or watch um, the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland's uh, Uvalde report. And what struck me most in that particular um, item was that there was not a clear leader and somebody giving direction on how forces were going to be deployed in order to deal with the um, the individual that came on campus and that had there been a clear leadership and clear direction on how um, force was going to be deployed in order to neutralize that assailant, um, many many children probably would have been saved that it took nearly an hour or an hour and a half before they were able to actually have somebody on that campus that took action um, to deal with that. So my recommendation of this is that there's continued discussions with the Sheriff's Department, whether or not we get an armed um, patrol approved on that, the teachers, the leadership on the various schools, the parents in the area, of how things are going to be handled if God forbid this happens in our community and that we have a clear plan and that those individuals that are going to be our first responders, they know exactly who's in charge and what action is going to be taken because that is something that's going to save lives in these situations. Um, and I think that's something that um, I don't know who can make those directions, but that's something that I want to see that there is a plan in place. So if somebody can give me assurances that that's being worked on, that's something that I'm looking forward. Um, the other thing that I was um, not finding in here was that as far as I know, um, I didn't see anything that talked about prevention. That I know the Boys and Girls Club is providing a lot of mental health um, support for our students and people in our community. And I didn't see where there was any plan or any outline of how the schools are going to be dealing with prevention. Um, I don't know if everybody saw last week, there was a mother that was convicted of involuntary manslaughter after her child took a gun to school and murdered four students. And that student gave one after another after another incidents that they were troubled. 
and it wasn't taken care of. So what are we doing to ensure that our children are being heard and that those children that are crying out for help have resources in order to get help? And I did not see this in the executive summary that that was dealt with and that we have anything in there besides what the Boys and Girls Club is providing to our community. So those are my big concerns. Thank you, thank you. I know they did look at that. I'd have to go back to the report to see what was in there, but I know that was covered and we can talk with the school district further about that. And also, uh, Nick Haywood with Guy Post has, oh, he's not. <laughs> what? Kerry Upton oh, has raised, raised his, his hand, hand if you'd like to hear from him. Okay. Kerry. Okay. Uh, I just want to um, respond to uh, Ms. Riggins uh, in that the report does not recommend the hiring of armed security. The report uh, does, excuse me, sorry, I have to tell this is something. Uh, the report also says that in discussions with the sheriff that they believe there would be uh, adequate response. As a district, we are a little concerned about that, but what we would ask of the sheriff's department and it's something actually y'all have a little more strength in recommending is that they actually do some drills and some uh, uh, inspections of whether or not that is true. And they work with their partners, uh, CHP and others, to make sure that when they do arrive, one person or people know who's in charge and how to move forward so that we don't see something like what happened at Uvalde. Uh, we do think that is the next step is to really check the findings of the report in regards to response time. Thank you, Carrie. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just follow up on that, that, you know, this is just like, let's take Woolsey for an example. The fire department is supposed to deploy in a certain manner in a certain way. And we saw the breakdown of response on that with the best of intentions. I just don't want to see our children be subject to the same type of, um, possible missteps. So plan, train, and hopefully we never have to implement it. Okay, any other comments? I'll take just a second. Uh, part of the, the armed response thing uh, when it came up, uh, apparently Beverly Hills parents also objected to armed, uh, armed security on campus. And what they ended up doing instead was they hired a firm that we, we uh, that we sent a request for proposals to, who actually now, today, patrol the perimeter of Beverly Hills schools. And uh, that was a compromise they came to with the staff and the parents. Uh, the, the security is, is outside in the immediate neighborhood uh, in the surrounding streets. And that's, uh, that's what they came up with. And the other, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is there's a thing in emergency services called the incident command system. And basically the way that works in the, in the uh, military is the first person to show up is in charge of what's going on. Now, if that first person shows up and is constantly having to defer to somebody else who shows up and not allowed to make a decision, that's a problem. And that's, uh, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else? Or this is the receiving file, so we don't have to vote, right? It's receiving file. It. Well, it also says to provide direction, does it not? Or no? I'll second it. Or third it. Or fourth it. Okay. We, and I think we did provide direction. Do you have more that you'd like to add? Well, I, I didn't know if others had suggestions that we could form consensus on or not. Well, how do we feel about um, having a report that there is a plan and that we have a command structure in place in the event that there's a response necessary? I think the response drill idea is a great one. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'd like to see, I, I, I'd be fine with that. One of the things I'd like to see is, as I said, follow up by the consultant on what progress is being made and what are the um, hot buttons that need to still be pressed to um, make sure our schools are safe, if that's not already part of the plan. I don't think that's part of the scope of work for that. Um, perhaps we could do that 
or we could amend the contract. We can. Well, maybe we could ask the schools, the, the, the school school system to provide us with that information as it comes along. I don't think okay. it's our responsibility as the city of Malibu to do that. It, I wouldn't mind spending the money to have the consultants do it, but um, I don't think it's the responsibility of our city staff to do that. It ought to be the schools themselves or the um, consultant that would keep us up to date on what's going on. Well, we can request, you know, periodic updates on the progress if that would help and we can report out, you know, with receive and file every, you know, every three or four months. What do you all think? Um, I would support that. Sorry, Sorry. Give me 90 days, 60 days, 90 days. What's a reasonable time period? You Once a quarter. Back on Pardon? Yeah. Once a quarter. How do the parents feel about that? They're the ones that have yeah. the little kids. Well, you know, the, the things I, I, we had suggested before that, and it sounds like they're heading towards that, in that direction of involving um, select teachers and, or staff and parents. Maybe um, they could get back to us and let us know what they think. Okay. So we got two recommendations. One to have a, a yeah, and just, and um, program and then. Question one of because uh, one of you asked for a report on whether there's a plan and then someone else said a drill. So I'm just wondering those are really two different things. So I'm just wondering do you want a report out on what the procedure is or do you want to recommend that we do a drill? Um, I can tell you that, you know, gosh, last summer, uh, Steve and I met with Captain C2, the police chief of Pepperdine. Isaac and some other stakeholders and we went over the whole procedures and you know in California I have to say it's a little bit different than in Texas the law enforcement fire department were very strict on the incident command system it's a well-run machine doesn't mean it's always goes perfect um, but it I feel like it would remove some of the issues that we're seeing in Texas where because here it is, whoever's first on scene is in charge. And then it just, depending on, you know, higher level people who show up, they transfer responsibility. I just want, I just want to know that there is a plan and mm -hmm. that it's practiced and in the event that it's ever needed, it will be executed yeah. professionally. Well, every summer they do do a drill at Pepperdine on a school shooting. So they do it on the Pepperdine campus. But even though that's on a call, you know, university campus, the, the operation, the procedures are basically the same. So I guess my question would be, is Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District taking part in that? Um, I believe. In order to make sure that. Chris, do you remember? In the. Carrie Upton's yeah. raised yeah. his hand. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Carrie. So just to say, uh, the uh, SIMS, the State Emergency Emergency Management System, and uh, you know California was one of the leaders in this that then created the NIMS, the National Emergency uh, Management uh, System, and our uh, school district staff and our uh, executive board and all of them, we follow that management system. Uh, we train in it. Uh, it's the way that we operate our emergency operations center system, our emergency operations center, uh, and uh, we are prepared to respond and be in response to those people who are also following it, whether it's fire or police. Uh, we've not been invited to a Pepperdine training uh, for school shooting. We'd be well. We'd be very interested in participating. We'd also be very interested in uh, them holding some trainings on our campus. Uh, uh, we've done some of that in Santa Monica with their rapid response team, and we'd be interested if, if at any time they want to try to uh, uh, do a drill on our campus with us. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. I would hope that the, the next one can involve the school district. And yeah, and just to, to be clear, the exercise that's done in, at Pepperdine is for law enforcement and fire agencies. However, 
It's a really great learning opportunity for the school district. They're always looking for volunteers to play victims. <laughs> and that may sound crazy, but you learn a lot watching how they operate. I've done it many times. It's very interesting and educational to see how it all works. So we could perhaps let them know when that comes up and any of their staff who wants to participate as a volunteer. Um, I would also encourage that we try and expand that and maybe that's something the council needs to look at paying for, but having those trainings at the actual school campuses. Um, one, because I don't know how many of our law enforcement ever step foot on those campuses. So are they even aware of the different areas, um, you know, the difference between MES and Webster, the difference, you know, the campuses are changing over at Malibu Middle and High School. Um, so just to make sure that any of our first responders are actually familiar with those different campuses so they know the way around and know where the office is versus where the classrooms versus where the multipurpose rooms are, et cetera, um, and all the potential access points that may be out there. Maybe Sergeant Sutherland can help us with that. Thank you. So every p patrol car is equipped with a, um, it's a, um, like a critical infrastructure map of all the schools. So those are in every single patrol car for the deputies. I can appreciate that, but um, having grown up on these campuses, there are places that everyone knows how to get to certain places and where to hide and different paths around the campuses. So um, I would just encourage if there's open houses or things like that that can be held with the first responders, both fire department and for sheriff's deputies and maybe even CHP, just so everybody's familiar on the ground with Absolutely. the campuses. Thank you. Can I, can I follow up on that? And, and before I do, one other question. Um, I believe it's the case that the full city council has not received the full report. Is that right? I'm not saying, no, I so um, is, is there any reason why we can't provide the full report to the balance of our council? I would ask Karen Isaac, are you comfortable with that? It's our report. I know. <laughs> We're yeah, trying to the... be respectful of their security reasons. Yes. I mean, I think that the, the city council, of course, could see it. It's just everybody on the council, as our board understands, you know, um, it needs not to be released to the community because that would put students at risk. Of course. Okay, and the, the, the follow-up is, I mean, uh, Marianne's point about knowing the schools, you know, th this isn't a large city, it's a small town, we only have a very small, a handful of schools. S having a map and going, and actually knowing the area, walking, or having walked around, knowing how to get around, not looking at a piece of paper or on your phone, is a world of difference. I mean, you know, SEAL team doesn't practice by looking at maps. They practice by mocking up the place that they're going to be going into so they can do it blindfolded. And I'm not suggesting we need that level of um, expertise here, although that would be great. But I think it would be great if we could um, impose upon Captain C2 to get our um, deputies and, and CHP, whoever's here, to actually visit all the schools more than once and walk around the halls, maybe when school's not in session, and get to learn the campuses. I think it can make a world of difference in a response if they're ever called to get there in an emergency. Yeah, I, I would agree 100% with that, Bruce. Um, it does make a huge difference to actually be on campus and we can work with the Sheriff's Department and I think it would be good on a day when maybe school's not in session um, to do something like that. Well, I, I, I want to just say that I would be in favor of guidepost solutions being involved in the monitoring of what is getting done and what's on the list to get done uh, at the, the school district's work list, which would be great. And I realize we may need to pay them for that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's worthwhile to have somebody checking our work. Perhaps we could bring back an item to consider an amendment to the consulting agreement to provide for that. What, what would you all think? It would be great if guideposts would let us know what they think of that idea. Let me put it that way. And then we can, we can, uh, if it doesn't even have to be a proposal from them, but we can give them some sort of not to exceed contract. I think it'd be worthwhile. Okay, well, I, I, Trevor can tell me if I'm wrong, but I, th I think we would need to actually formally vote on that yeah. as an agendized item at a future meeting. 
Yeah. So I, I would like to see something, a discussion on that come back to us where we could make a formal decision as to how to proceed. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, do we, did we ever get an estimate of what the, uh, a roving armed security firm would cost? Is that something that? I don't recall. I don't recall getting a bid for that. I got, uh, we, we had lists of things, but we didn't know what would be the best to do. And we, uh, and guidepost, I don't think the report recommended that, by the way. But I, I'll take a look at it again. Okay. Did anyone give a second to Bruce's idea to bring it back to the council? Sure. Second. Third. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No? Okay, all well done. Anybody else? That's it. Okay, thank you very much. We're on to item 4A. 4A. Yolanda, you're up. Yes, sir. Good evening, City Council. The item before you is a first reading to Ordinance 515 exterior elevated elements. To provide you with a little bit of background, almost nine years ago in 2015, a fourth floor balcony at an apartment complex in Berkeley, California collapsed. The collapse killed six people and injured seven more. A subsequent investigation revealed that years of exposure to moisture led to dry rot along the top of the cantilever balcony framing, causing them to disintegrate. In the wake of this tragedy, local and state agencies moved to address deficiencies in the law around construction, maintenance, and inspections of balconies decks and exterior elements. An exterior element as defined by the California legislature is a balcony, deck, stairways, walkways, entry structures that extend beyond exterior walls in the building, including their supports and railing systems. The exterior elevator Elevated Elements program was designed to safeguard public safety and to give a concise, a streamlined process that will assist in making the necessary repairs and upgrades to the required structures. The California State Senate Bill SB 721 was approved in September of 2018 requiring local jurisdiction to regulate multifamily inspections of elevated elements. Subsequently, on August of 2019, the California Senate Bill SB 326 was approved to further amend the code to include inspections for condominiums associations. The purposes of this law is to monitor the maintenance of the structural integrity of the building components. This compliance deadline is January 1st of 2025. The inspections are intended to identify supporting elements that exhibit signs of deterioration, such as corrosion, water damage and decay, and determine if the extent of the deterioration has been compromised the load carrying capacity of the supporting elements. In addition, in knowing the complexity of our buildings, Malibu Ordinance 515 will require inspections and that this assessment to be performed only by a California licensed architect or a California licensed civil or structural engineer. The ongoing maintenance of exterior elevated elements in safe and functional condition is the responsibility of the owner of the building. These assessments are to be completed by January 1st of 2025 
And by January 1st of every six years thereafter, for owners of multifamily and nine years for condominiums associations. The emergency repair conditions as described on the reports and recommendations need to be done in, as an immediate repair. Within the 15 days, the owner must bring it to the building department and must be uh, perform required uh, preventive measurements immediately with the required permits and following our city's municipal code. For the non-emergency conditions, the owner of the building is required to have corrective work on the exterior elevated elements within 120 days of receive of that report. Once the permits are approved, the owner of the building shall have 120 days to make the repairs unless the city grants an extension. Finally, the exterior elevated recommendations actions for this evening is introducing on first reading the ordinance 515 to create the process to regulate exterior elevated elements for multifamily dwelling units within the city. Second, direct staff to schedule a second reading and adoption of the ordinance for the February 26th city council meeting. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Yolanda. Any questions? I have Paul? a question. Yeah, any, oh, excuse oh, me, we, any public comment? We can ask questions first. Okay. You have a question? Or, or I have you? a question. It, it seems that this does not, would not cover, in, in my time in Malibu, I can remember two balcony collapses. Both of them were in the condos that are next to Moon Shadows. They're not actually condos. They're single family dwellings with a zero lot line between them. And those are single family dwellings legally. Are they covered or not? No, this law only is. Um, why not? And how, what can we do to add them? Why not? Let me answer the first question. Sure. Um, both of the bills passed in 2018 and 2019 are concentrated only on multifamilies. This is for three or more dwelling units. Now your question number two, why not? If it's the request of the council to add single family dwellings, that is something that we can add to this provision of the law. I think that those particular ones have shown that there is a, a because of the, the corrosive atmosphere that they're subject to, and that they are more subject than, than most things to uh, having problems. Uh, they also have steel frameworks underneath them rather than wood. And they, if people don't keep up with the corrosion underneath them, I've seen units in there shift. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important that that maintenance is kept up and that people don't utilize them improperly or people will get hurt. And we actually had a person die about 20 years ago. This last collapse there, nobody was killed, thank God but there's still tons of litigation going around about that. So I, I think it's valid to want that done. And my, also my dream list is, what are we gonna do about soft stories, which has nothing to do with this? And I have an answer for you. Good, thank you. Soft stories, we have completed uh, the assessment of the number of soft stories in the city. I'm grateful. Yes, additionally, uh, and this is not moving up from the topic, um, possibly a proposal for the uh, upgrades or um, bringing those soft stories into compliance for the next fiscal year. So that is to come. Uh, Bruce? Th this will really be a question, not a comment. Um, what um, outreach has been done, if any, for the owners of multifamily dwellings and condominium units beyond publishing this and putting it out for us to approve? Beyond, we have uh, created a website. We are going to be sending letters, but I wanted to wait to see what was the result of tonight's uh, meeting so we can start doing more outreach. Okay, but that would be outreach informing people what the law now 
has become not outreach to, to, to hear their input as to whether we ought to adopt this and what the parameters would it be? It is a mandatory uh, law. So even if the city decide not to adopt it, it is, it is mandatory. So, we're, so what we're being asked to do here is ministerial? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Just a quick clarifying point. We're passing this ordinance 515 because the state's mandated that we pass the ordinance, correct? Okay. That is correct. All right. Um, yeah. any, any speaker slips? We don't have any speaker slips, but I believe we have Zoom speakers. You got to submit a oh, speaker I, slip before I didn't the get a speaker discussion slip, Norm. Did you? Does it make any difference? Is he a speaker slip? No. Go ahead, go ahead, I just want to say this has nothing. This is nothing to do with Norm. But I, I object to individualized um, allocations of time that are inconsistent with our protocol. I'll make it very short. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this. Uh, Commissioner Grisanti is 100% correct. Um, many of the single family uh, homes that I, I have inspected myself um, do have problems that people don't know it. Um, in one particular case, the web of the steel I-beam was actually their huge hole in the web. And that is the only thing that keeps the flanges from coming together and failing. Um, so we need to do it for single family homes and I would suggest civil engineers or structural engineers, architects, quite frankly, don't have the background to make the decision uh, as to whether a, there is a problem and then if there is a problem, how to solve it. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Norm. Next time, speaker slips, Norm. Uh, who's on the Zoom? There's one raised hand from Ryan. Ryan, you're on. Uh, yes, I'd like to say I've served on the board of my condominium project for probably a decade, and we've never had a balcony. Um, well, the balconies that fall off are, are the ones on the beach, as, as um, our council member has stated, and that is completely exempt from this ordinance. This is a huge, huge burden on financial um, addition for condominium projects and as far as an implementation plan for the city um, I believe that you should focus on balconies that are more than 20 feet off the ground or that are over rock revetment or boulders or the beach um, where there's some unstable surface below and as an interim measure um, anything that's above 20 feet off the ground should probably be inspected sooner. And there's hundreds of condos that would have to deal with this, and the sky's the limit to what a structural engineering firm or company will try and bait the associations to pay outrageous fees to comply with the, the early adoption date. I would hope and the city would ask the state to extend the date of the implementation of this ordinance so it can be done in a more coordinated and cost-effective manner. But the city needs to address the worst case scenarios and prioritize in that fashion. And anything that's less than 20 feet above, you know, a lawn or some other fixed surface, that's about the length of a large or a long car. Our parking spaces in the city's code are, I think, 20 feet long. So it's, it's not as, as much different as it sounds. But as an interim measure, I would suggest that you limit occupancy to four persons per 100 square feet on a balcony as an interim safety measure for lower level balconies, maybe first floor balconies, or a, you know something that's made out of concrete or steel might not need this if they're not on the water. But uh, I would like you to prioritize an inter interim um, implementation plan to go along with this and ask the state for a one-year extension. Thank you. Any comments from the council? Yes. Marianne? 
Um, I had a couple questions. One, um, where does planning fit in this? Are they going to be required to get an over-the-counter or some other type of planning approval in addition to the building permit? So just a clarification on this ordinance. This ordinance only um, requires the assessment to be completed by January 1st of 2025. The assessment will be brought to the building official. We will then review the assessment. For anything that is an emergency, we will have to follow planning's um, guidelines, our local guidelines. If it's an emergency, some type of shoring needs to be done, but a permit will be required. Okay. And then um, what uh, implementation do we need to do at the city level to be able to apply this to single family or duplexes? If you want to expand it um, beyond the reach here, you would need to notice it for um, either this to come back with those changes, or you could pass it tonight and have it brought back as an amendment. So do we have uh, any consensus to expand it to single family, or would we rather have that on a separate ordinance? I think we'd be better off with a separate ordinance, and yeah. there's probably other places that we need to think through where this criticality is. I also want to cautious the council on the number of structures mm -hmm. that will require, and you don't have the staffing for that. Right. Yeah. Right now, for the multifamily, just doing a brief um, going through the database of how many structures we're having, you're, we're going to have close to 700 structures coming in. Those structures might have 10. 15 balconies, so we have an apartment complex that has 107 units. Not that the 107 units have balconies, yeah. but this, the level of work that this is going to take is significant. If yeah. the council is considering adding this to single family residents, absolutely, I will do whatever you want me to do. But I need to ask for staffing levels. I do not have the staffing right. levels. Well, I. I think uh, in light of what uh, Elena just stated, it does need to take uh, a prioritization of what we really need to right. attack. But more than that, uh, I'm, now that you tell me there's 700, this takes effect in less than 10 months. Yes, sir. There is no way in the world for everybody to do all those inspections, is it? It's just, it's, does it require assessment? So it's just an observation. We're asking that the civil engineer, a structure engineer, or architects as the assessment. The, the, the work doesn't need to be completed. The assessment needs to be completed. That the observation, the inspection needs to be completed. Okay, but you're saying inspection. I can understand if it was an open wood deck, for example. But a lot of these are enclosed in stucco or whatever. You can't do that kind of inspection just by visual. Or, does it only, or is it only for wood? decks that I have exposed beams. It applies to all of the decks, timber, uh, timber, uh, steel, concrete, it applies to all of them. The, the state of California, the engineer association has an S specific guidelines that follows it. ASCE um, standards follow exactly how to do this type of observations, has a checklist on how to do this type of observations. All right. Go ahead, Mary, because I got a couple questions on this one. I was just going to reiterate that, you know, we've seen when was the debt collapse that occurred? 2021. Right. And I would say that the homes that are surrounding that particular location are going to also be, you know, if, if a homeowner doesn't take the proactive steps to maintain their property, this is going to happen, and it's going to happen very easily on beachfront homes specifically, but everywhere in Malibu, every, you know, we all know what the maintenance is like on any of our homes. We have a special maintenance because of the fact that we're exposed to the sea air, no matter where our properties are. And also a number of our structures, especially these duplexes and um, other multifamily residents are old. I mean, I, I can't think of the large complexes. I think all of them predate cityhood, don't they? That's true. So, you know, we're talking 30 plus years that those buildings have been up there. So if they don't have active HOAs that are doing this um, or active homeowners, you know, some of the beachfront homes, especially on the east end of town, 
you're looking at homes that are 50, 60, 70 years old. So I think it is important that if we have to hire consultants to help with these assessments or something else, that's something the that we city, should consider. Um, I'm sorry, the city cannot do the assessments. No, I understand that. That the consultants, the private um, civil and structural engineers and possible architects are gonna be the ones doing the assessments. But eventually the city is going to have to be doing building plan checks and other things in order to do any maintenance or repairs that are identified by these assessments. That so is correct. if You're we need to hire additional consultants to help with that workload, I think that's something that this council should, or a future council should consider is this. Bruce? Actually, I, I, I don't support bringing back an item period on this. If it weren't for the fact that the state adopted this law, we would not even be having this hearing tonight because nobody on this council or any prior council or any member of the staff has suggested or proposed that we do this. This is a, the, the state law is a knee-jerk paternalistic boondoggle re response to what happened in Berkeley. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a boondoggle for the people that are gonna make a ton of money doing these inspections. It's knee-jerk because it was in response to some public outcry from an isolated incident. And it's paternalistic in that it is assuming that people won't take care of their own properties, that the free market through trial lawyers and insurance companies won't regulate the industry in the first place. We're responsible for giving building permits in the first place. We're not responsible for ensuring that people upkeep their homes is my, my understanding. People have a responsibility to do that on their own. And if they don't and people get injured, then they'll get sued, which ought to be a good reason to take care of your property. Um, so I wouldn't favor extending this to single family homes. I don't, and this is why I asked the question about outreach before we even adopt this. Um, is every single thing we are being proposed to say in this legislation a word that we're mandated to be, to, to approve by the state? Like, this is just one of those things like we follow the county code, so when the county code changes, we must adopt the same county code in our city? That is correct. It's following uh, state law. Okay, so, you know, I, I'm going to support doing what we're mandated to do by state law, but I don't favor extending this paternalistic legislation beyond what we're being mandated to do. Anybody else? I'm willing to vote for what's what you've brought to us, and I will tell you that in the course of and scope of my business and over the last 45 years, I've been in a number of properties that have had dangerous decks, and it's pretty easy for somebody with a basic understanding of what is a, a bad sign to determine what you don't want to go out onto. And I may be a coward, but I have watched somebody go all the way through a wood deck and it, it was not funny. And so, you know, this is for multifamily, great, let's do it for multifamily. But I think that, that uh, a, the condominium projects, it really will not take that long for an inspector to go around they will need no more than 10 minutes of balcony to look at it and say, I see cracks, I don't see cracks, it's sagging. I mean, with a level, you can tell a lot. So I'm gonna vote for this. Okay, uh, and Paul's comment reminds me of another, another built-in feature is that whenever anybody goes to sell their home, there's, there's gonna be an inspection by the buyer. And if there's a problem with the deck, they're either not gonna buy the property or it's gonna get fixed. Okay, I think I got a motion and a second. Oh, you, oh. I do not have a motion. I, I Call me a motion. I'll second. I got a, I got a question real quick. This law looks like it passed in 2019. That is correct. So why are we just now seeing this law, this 515 today, and are you already getting inspections reports? I would think people would be on top of this if they were aware of it. Yes. Prior to that, we, we were doing voluntarily. We received one uh, assessment already. Um, talking to other jurisdictions, we're probably one out of, on the whole on the whole LA County and Ventura County, one out of many jurisdictions that bring anything to their city council. No one has done anything about it. Wow, okay. Um, I do think we need to get a, a, a very robust uh, outreach program. People need to learn about this. Uh, if I was on the HOA board, I'd, I'd be shocked that suddenly now I gotta have this done in 10 months. So, all right, 
Do we have a second? I think, oh, I think we got a motion and a second. And Trevor, you've got to read the ordinance. We had a motion and a second to uh, introduce on first reading ordinance. It's number uh, 515, an ordinance of the city of Malibu determining the project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and adding chapter 15.30 to title 15 of the Malibu Municipal Code, creating a process to regulate exterior elevated elements within the city. Okay. Kelsey, we need a roll call, please. Councilmember Crisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Earing? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. Let's move on to item 6B. Wonder if we could take a break. Want to take a break? Everybody? All right, okay. let's take 9.30, be back here. Too many minutes. 9.27. Huh? Good <laughs> idea. <laughs>
I was in my seat. I was ready to work. Okay, we're on item 6B, the financial second quarter financial report, and then your budget amendments. I guess, Joe, this is your baby. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. We are presenting the fiscal year 23-24 mid-year financial report, also referred to as the second quarter or Q2 report. Um, this is a high-level overview, and we'll touch on the significant variances uh, in our projections for the period ending December 31st, 2023. So for uh, all funds, total revenues, uh, so far to date, we've received 25.6 million or 31.1%, uh, but we're projecting to end the year at 84.2 million in revenue. Um, that's nearly 2 million more than the amended, uh, which for all intents and purposes is pretty much coming in at budget or as expected. Um, expenditures, uh, we have 25.5 million year to date or 26.7% and we're projecting to in the year at 86.4 million. That's about 91% of the amended budget, so a savings there and that's about 8.9 less than the amended and we're projecting that of uh, mostly of general fund savings which you'll see uh, on the fund balance report when we get to that. So in the general fund, uh, this is where the council has the most discretion. Uh, these are your discretionary dollars. The revenues, we've received 21.3 million, and that's 37% of the budget, but we're projecting to slightly exceed the amended budget at 59.4 million, or about 2 million more than amended, which is fairly close to budget, so we're not making any significant revenue adjustments at this time. Uh, on the expenditure front, uh, We've uh, spent 19.95 million, just, just short of 20 million, or 28.3%. That's well under the halfway mark, uh, even though we're still projecting 61.1 million uh, to end the year. But that will still be a savings, as that's only about 87.4% of the amended budget. So that's where that 8.9 million uh, projected savings is coming from on the expenditure side. And I'll get into some of the details of that shortly. Um, <clears throat> So the fiscal impact, uh, again, this is where it appears that expenditures are exceeding revenues. If you look at that chart on the right where we're projecting, but uh, that's due to some of the capital projects that are funded with general fund dollars. So if we remove those capital dollars, the general fund revenues are actually at about 57.3 million of what we're projecting, and the general fund expenditures are about 47 million. So that's about a $10 million net financial impact. And on the fund balance page, you can see that uh, 10 million, uh, if you look at um, that page, I think it's uh, A11, uh, on the top line, you can see where there's about 10 million in general fund before you get into the transfers, uh, about 10 million uh, savings across revenue and expenditures. So to give you some of the main drivers on the revenue front uh, and the expenditure front, so property tax, uh, as you recall, we, we budget or prepare the budget as we're doing right now for the next fiscal year. We do it in the spring. Um, so that's before the, the books close and before we know uh, how revenues are looking or before we even know what the final county tax, property tax rule was. Um, so the county property tax rule for 22-23 ended at 8% increase. That has a domino effect into how we budgeted prior year. Um, thankfully, we did some adjustments last year at mid-year that kind of got us more in line with where property taxes are falling. Um, but we still are projecting a slight increase with that uh, property tax rule. So we're projecting the end of the year with about 600000 more in property taxes than we initially budgeted. Um, and we mostly put that into the secure property tax line on your reports. Um, but overall, um, we are projecting about 18.6 million in property tax, and last year we came in at about 17.9 million. Um, on the other taxes, some of the other main areas where our revenues come in, the utility users tax, we're projecting about 500,000 more than the amended. Um, we ended 22-23 with about 3 million. It's, it's not entirely sure what's caused the increase, but uh, we're assuming that a lot of that um, spiked during the pandemic. So if you look at the prior years, um, there was a large increase during the pandemic of about, f it went up to about 4.6 million in utility users. It's kind of come back down a little bit. Um, but uh, right now we're, we're projecting to keep it in line with where we ended 22-23, which is about $3 million. Where are uh, you looking on your 
in the package. I'm sorry. So, I, um, s sorry, some of that is a, a reference point. I'm giving you some background detail, but if you look at okay. um, other taxes, so if you look at page, let me pull it up. If you look at revenues on page uh, A1 or five of your report, you can see some of the line items. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the line I was looking at was 3132 utility users tax. Um, so we're gonna project to end the year at about 3 million. That's about 500,000 more than we amended. Uh, but of note, the prior years, it had uh, oscillated a little bit. It spiked above 4 million, and we think that was mostly just due to the pandemic and people using more electricity, but it's kind of come back down a little bit to what seems like 3 million will be our normal baseline. Um, TOT is another major tax uh, source for us. We're projecting in total between the two lines, so that's the hotels and motels and your private rentals, uh, to come in at about 9.5 million. Um, and that's right in line with where we ended last year. And then sales tax, uh, we're projecting to end the year at nearly 300,000 more than amended. And this is mostly due to the uh, TUT measure that we put in place. So initially, you'll recall when we uh, went to ballot, we said it would, we estimated about $3 million uh, per year. It's actually coming in higher than that. So far, uh, we're looking at about $3.6 million in TUT. So it's doing better than anticipated. And then there's some offsets in sales tax uh, as well, but still uh, projecting about 300,000 more than amended. And then the other area where there's some changes, we're, we're projecting service charges might be a little bit overstated um, from where we were uh, in 22, 23. We saw that uh, come down a little bit. So uh, we actually think there might be a little bit of a decrease in our service charges this year. We're projecting uh, to end at about uh, 550,000 less than we initially uh, budgeted. So that's on the revenue side. On the general fund expenditures, still the, the story is salaries and benefits. And this is uh, starting on page uh, A6 of your report. Um, salaries and benefits are still the, the main driver of our savings and expenditures. Um, while we started to see some positive uh, improvement in our vacancies last year, towards the end of uh, the second quarter, or during the second quarter of this year, we had a number of retirements, uh, we had some separations, so we're still seeing, experiencing about a 20% vacancy rate, um, but uh, doing as many recruitments as we can to, to start filling those numbers. So that's the main driver across departments. Um, so looking at departments, management and administration, most of that savings that we're projecting is salaries and benefits. Um, jumping down public safety services, um, you'll recall we increased our uh, public safety budget due to our anticipation of the substation opening. Um, we have not been able to fill that uh, or open that substation. Um, but we have offset some of those savings with additional increases that we're seeing with CHP for PCH uh, and other measures that we're doing in public safety. But at the end of the day, we're still projecting about $2 million savings from what we budgeted for public safety. Community services, there's some salary savings across uh, the, across the department as well, uh, but the department has encumbered uh, some funds for park maintenance services. Um, and so we don't anticipate uh, too much savings beyond, beyond that. There should be some more expenditures in the spring. Um, or I take that back, I'm sorry, we projected about uh, one and a half million. So if you're looking at your report, just to help you follow along a little bit, A A6, we're looking at community services now, the total department budget, and we look at the projected column. Um, so you'll see there's about 3.15 million in our projected column. The amended budget has about 4.5 million. So that's where you see where we're projecting savings um, or increases uh, to help, hopefully help you follow along. Mm -hmm. um, and then environmental sustainability, uh, they are primarily experiencing um, some increases with uh, contract services this year, but still some savings from uh, salaries and benefits and the same with planning. So those are our main drivers of what's going on in the general fund. And then during our administration and finance subcommittee, uh, there was a request to see year-over-year -year numbers. 
uh, for this period in Q2 of 23, 24 compared to prior years. I did forward this to you before the meeting, but I know you probably haven't had a chance to look at it. I won't spend too much time here, uh, but for the most part, if you remove the COVID impacts on the revenues, you'll see slow and steady growth year over year occurring. And on the expenditure side, uh, similar if you remove some of the COVID impacts where we had decreases in expenditures, um, we've kind of come back to normalcy and then you start to see some growth as you would expect as uh, things become more expensive and as we start to um, have more positions in place. Um, but this year we do have during the first half a little more activity uh, than prior years and that's primarily due to the fact that we've uh, done a debt service payment a little earlier in the year than we did uh, past fiscal years. The public safety increases again, um, ESD and planning having some increased activity in professional services, and then public works having some more uh, street maintenance. For uh, revenue amendments, um, again, we were, were projecting uh, about $2 million more, but for the most part, we thought it was at budget. We didn't want to make any adjustments at this time. We'll see how the year ends. Uh, so the only adjustment we're making is a grant that we need to uh, have the appropriation for, and that's a SoCal Gas Coastal Vulnerability Grant, so only a $50,000 adjustment. So overall, the total amended revenue budget will be uh, $82.5 million. That includes some of the uh, special revenue fund adjustments. On the expenditure side, total general fund amendments are nearly $1.1 million. Uh, the big changes are public works with storm response, as well as replacing some trash receptacles and changeable message signs. Uh, so they're looking for an increase. Um, community services, or uh, excuse me, um, CSD modifying uh, some positions of the permanent part-time to, or excuse me, from part-time to permanent part-time so that they have benefits that should help with retention. Um, and you'll see the uh, recommended action for uh, adopting a new salary resolution. And they're also trying to add a new uh, pool office trailer that has previously been damaged. And then planning, uh, looking to increase some appropriation authority for their ongoing contract planner needs. Um, again, uh, we're not uh, changing any of the FTE count, but we are looking to change the job specification on the Recreation Assistant 2. This is where I mentioned we're changing a part-time to a permanent part-time. This uh, provides benefits, and our, we believe that this will help fill some of those positions that we've uh, had to have a number of part-time staff to fill those posts, that by providing benefits, this will provide some, um, some retention of the staff and provide some better continuity of operations. So summary of the expenditure changes, nearly one and a half million in mid-year amendments overall. Um, again, that was nearly 1.1 of general fund and then uh, nearly 400,000 of special revenue funds. <clears throat> um, and the special revenue changes are mainly due to capital project changes. So the total expenditure budget with the proposed amendments would be 96.7 million. And looking at our fund balance page, the uh, general fund undesignated would, we're projecting to end at 67.9 million, nearly 68 million. Uh, there's a, again about 10 million gross revenue over expenditures in the general fund, but net of transfers and capital, um, capital changes, that's about uh, the total, I'm sorry, the total general fund actually decreases from 87.5 million to 85.4 million, so it's a $2 million decrease after we net out the transfers and the capital projects. Um, the undesignated first line, that is where you truly have your discretion, and again, that's 67.9 million. And then you still have the general fund contingencies uh, available to you at 6.5 million. And overall, total funds, fund balance, about 99 million. Uh, we have on your council calendar the uh, workshop, of the strategic work plan workshop for March 20th of next month. Um, and we will be coming back with more details of that, but that'll be your six month interval to review your uh, top priorities and see if you want to make any adjustments. 
And then looking at the budget calendar, we've already kicked off the fiscal year 24-25 budget schedule. Um, we will be coming in March with the general fund uh, grant process. Those applica that application period is actually already open. Uh, we plan to have the budget workshop in April. And then in May, we go to the administration and finance subcommittee to review the proposed budget. And then we also have a public hearing. And then we look to final adoption in June. And with that, that high level report, we're looking to receive and file the 23-24 Q2 report, uh, adopt resolution 2403, amending the budget, and also adopting resolution 2404, amending the authorized positions and salary ranges. And we're available for any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions before we go to public comment? Marianne? How old is the pool trailer? Uh, almost two decades. Okay. <laughs> it's deteriorated. <laughs> and um, it, that 120000 is that just for the trailer or is that for installation and? I am being told it's for everything. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Any public comments? Mayor, you should have a speaker slip in hand, I believe, well, for Joe, Joe Drummond. Joe Drummond, yes, you're up first. And we got hands? There's one raised hand. Do I guess? <laughs> so um, I did send an email today to Mr. Tony about about I mean the hundred million in investment surplus and over four million dollars in revenue with over half a million profit or actually it's two million dollars profit because you get another two million from geo and building plan check fees makes a minimum of two million dollars profit off of the permit fees. So I'd hope that these fees can be reduced for regular residents with small projects at the very least, and especially septic operating per permit fees. I think it's $500 for um, Eli Jr. to come and do your test for the operating permit, but then the city just stamps that, they do all the work, and they charge more, like $530 or something. So that needs to be reduced. Um, I mean, there's, I think there was 400000 in... Uh, code violation fees, like I think that those should be go going up, like the huge wedding tent on Broad Beach and the Yves Saint Laurent event from the last year, they were only charged, I think that that event was only charged $10,000 or something, but it was, they could obviously afford more than that. So please remember that fee for service under Prop 218 states that the amount of the fee may not exceed the cost of government to provide the service. So, and to talk about my case, in March 21, I put in an application for an after the fact emergency remodel of two bathrooms, adding a sauna and adding a 64 square foot deck. It took over a year and a half and a new environmental health administrator, Paula Quinto, to finally get information that I could complete a water balance study in order to keep our outdoor shower. Then it took almost three years for the planning department to agree that a variance was not required for my small deck through due to exemptions through 13.4 of the LCP. And I know Marianne was trying to help me with all of it. In the meantime, I was overcharged for geotechnical review fees that were not required. It also took a long, a, a long time to move this project from OTC to APR, administra administrative permit review. So, so far I'm up to $6,000 in permit fees and 5,000 in geotechnical engineering and water balance study fees. So now it's $11,000. In San Bernardino, I have a cabin in Lake Arrowhead, my husband and I, and I just applied for a permit in December 2015 for a new bathroom to convert a storage room to a bathroom, and it's $543 in fees, and they respond immediately. They, like, I, I think I've been, explained everything online. I think you should check out the San Bernardino permit area because they... That they just tell you exactly what it is, and then the engineer respond to me immediately. Like it's been almost two months, and it's almost it's almost approved. So there is a difference in other cities. So just if you have all this money, please help the residents like me. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Ryan. Ryan. You out there, Ryan? Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. 
Okay, I wanted to say, I wanted to also ask and have the staff answer these very few questions that have to do with um, sales tax revenue, which is largely a component of the price of gasoline sales in Malibu and restaurant uh, revenues. The other has to do with the utility tax revenue and why that went up. It's because the electric rates and natural gas rates, you know, skyrocketed uh, recently and are not likely to go down either. And under that category, the city should be using those resources to fast track all of the um, applications for these wireless transmitters from the cell phone companies all up and down all the neighborhood power poles because basically they want to sell wireless internet into everybody's homes. And these applications should be covered by the fees that are being charged. And the city can augment that with all of this $3 million of revenue it's getting from the utility uh, users tax as well. This is done by a private contractor, which I think you call CMS, um, and why they are not uh, able to stay on top of these uh, applications, I don't understand, because you just tell them you want them to do more work and I'm sure they'll do it. So we didn't figure that one out. But lastly is the fee justification study needs to go along with these reports because uh, some of these fees are pretty unbelievable um, or as what the prior speaker was saying is that uh, are you are you assigning too many staff hours to the permits and are those staff hours really being involved in the processing of the permits? Are you just spreading out the cost over the entire department? Um, and so trying to recoup you know fees in that manner. So the fee justification study, I know you have to do it all the time. I think you maybe need to do a top to bottom study, maybe by a different contractor this time uh, to figure out uh, if the city is not uh, making money off of the residents uh, with these fees. So please answer the questions about the utility users revenue and the sales tax revenue. And the last one is the interest revenue that um, the city's hopefully been getting on certificates of deposit through a ladder or um, staggered uh, uh, maturity dates of CDs that when the interest rates have been very high and may likely go down in the future, you might want to lock in some money at current rates um, on that. Thank you. That's it. Those okay. are all the raised hands. No more raised hands? Okay. Close public comment back up to the council table. Any questions, comments? Marianne? Um, to address a couple things, um, one, uh, FEMA, how much, are, are those funds coming in still from Woolsey and do we still have outstanding items for reimbursement from FEMA? Or are these new FEMA claims? Um, Council Member uh, Regans, off, off the top of my head, I don't have the list of projects, but we do have uh, projects in flight that are related to the most recent storms the last couple of years, and I do believe we still have some uh, Woolsey Fire uh, efforts there as well that itself have to be closed out with FEMA, but for the most part, they're they're wrapping up. Okay. Um, grant funds. I know we had a, a grant writer. Have we gotten a report on the success um, or any grants that they have been able to, are we going to get a, a, a report at an, uh, a council meeting with regards to that? Uh, we should have a receive and file report in March, March 11th. Thank you. Um, the fee study, I know we did a fee study a few years ago. Um, are we currently out for a fee study right now? We are. So the council approved that uh, towards the end of fall of last year. Uh, the contract was executed at the end of the year and we kicked it off uh, in January. So they're currently starting to do the study right now. And it's my recollection that the current fee study that we're under is online. So um, the residents are able to review that 
see what the parameters are of it and how it's determined how those fees are done. Correct, and it, it's outdated. I think it was 2015, 16, if I'm not mistaken, was the last year it was done, which is why we're doing another um, full study right now to reassess all our fees, and then every year it's been increased by inflation. Right. Um, and on the comment that uh, Ms. Drummond made, the, the OWAT uh, renewal, um, I, I personally also would like to have that, you know, the the fee for the initial um, OWTS permit um, is probably appropriate to be at a higher rate, but when you're coming in for a renewal, um, I would like to see either in the fee study or some other method to make sure that um, the amount of review is commiserate with that fee. I would question that. Yeah, and, and Councilman Rings, this is a, uh, by way of a little bit of background. So what they do is they do a full, a comprehensive study of the amount of staff time spent on every type of initiative and then how that applies to each fee. So we get the full overhead costs or indirect costs that are internal, how that, and then that schedule comes before you. Um, you'll have that updated report and then it'll really be up to this council if you want to adopt those fees as recommended or you want to make any adjustments where you have discretion. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Paul? Hi, Joe. Uh, I, I also, as a result of my business experience, have had many discussions about septic operating permits. And my discussions with the department uh, come down to the fact that what they what we ha what we do on a regular basis is we have a database that has been built up over the last I, what is it 10 years 15 years and and that's constantly being updated not only with your renewal and things like that but also with records from the receivers of all the pumpings that are done in the area so anytime a pumping is done anywhere else they get if they have to list the the source for what's what's being discharged and that comes to the city of malibu so that database is part of what you're paying for when you pay your renewal fee and i'm i'm sorry but it is a lot of hours and i don't know if the number of hours that they spent are justified or not but there's a lot of legitimately there is a heck of a lot of time involved in doing stuff that's not receiving the uh, the application from the homeowner and and then turning out the approval that is necessary in order to actually have the the system function so if I, uh, council member Gersani, i think we're uh, if i followed you correctly you're essentially referring to indirect costs so your overhead costs that are administrative whether it be maintenance of systems writing staff reports so on and so forth how, how much time staff in each department spends on a certain area and so some of that might be the maintenance of a database or maintaining well the database in this case is is a crucial part of compliance and so it it is a single purpose database and i think that's i think that there's going to be a lot of hours that show up in there when they, when they do the the check on it so i've never gotten anywhere with the previous line of discussion let me put it that way anybody else comments i'll make a motion to approve uh, we have two motions that need to be done uh 2403 and 2404 i'll make a motion to approve each of those second Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? So ordered. Moving along. Item 6C, Malibu Little League wait fee, wait fee Waiver. Kristen, I think this is yours. And I'm hoping this will be quick. All right, Here. I'll take it. Uh, good evening, Mayor Uring and members of council. The item before you is a fee waiver requests from Malibu Little League, which is the primary organization coordinating youth baseball and softball for approximately 275 players. ML MLL is a nonprofit parent-led organization established in Malibu before the city's incorporation in 1991. Malibu Little League also works with the city to invest in field improvements, such as extending the batting cages, adding soft toss, soft toss bays, and upgrading uh, the field turf. Little League has requested uh, $34,000 this uh, season, and this includes facility use at 
Bluffs Park from February to July 2024, in addition to um, Snack Shack equipment rentals. Uh, this concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments from up here? We've got a public comment. Paul? I'm sorry. Okay, Jake Lingo, you're up. I'll make this quick. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to the council uh, last year for your decisive action in helping us get the temporary snack shack set up. It was a huge success. Uh, we did get it up in time for closing day and for the All-Stars. And so I wanted to first just get up and say thank you for that. Um, I've got some stuff written here, but I think I'll skip it. And I'll just say um, that this is critical and for our ability to meet our expenses is to have this fee waiver, which traditionally we've had for however many years. And so I appreciate the consideration. And I also like to extend an invitation um, for the uh, opening day. We're gonna be doing the parade like we did for closing day last year. We'd love to have the council back out to ride in the lead car. That'll be on March 2nd. That's coming up in about three weeks. So I'll get you, uh, maybe email you that information and we'd love to have you all out there again. So thank cool. you so much. And riding the same caddy? Sure. Okay, cool. Sure. <laughs> uh, anybody, any comments from up here? Any, any hands? No, there's no raised hands. Any comments from this side? I'll make a motion to approve. Hey, Bruce? Well, I'll second that, but I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, the staff report says at the very beginning that the, on fiscal impact that the loss of revenue is estimated to be $34,000. Would the fields be rented otherwise to someone else that we would be making that $34,000? Not necessarily. Well, the $34,000 would be paid by Little League. Right, but it's, it not, to use but it's it. only a loss of revenue if somebody else would have used it, because they can't afford it. So, I mean, we're basically just letting them use the field, right? We're not losing right. money. Unless you told them to pay it, then you would lose right. that. You're right. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't view that as a loss of yeah. money. I, I would view it as a loss of money if there were other sources of income that we're giving up to get, to, to give the field to the Little League. So I just want to make that comment. Okay, I got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Okay, so ordered. Move on to item number 6D, Agreement for Community Outreach and Education. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you, you have staff's recommendation for contract award for community outreach um, and engagement. I do wanna make that clarification. Engagement related to city-owned vacant lots. On August 16th, 2023, during a special work session of the City Council, direction was given to add the RFP for outreach and engagement of city-owned vacant lots as part of the top priorities identified in the strategic work plan. Immediately following adoption of the work plan on September 27th, staff released an RFP for the initiative um, on October 5th, uh, the deadline for which was October 27th, and a total of nine proposals were received. Um, three tasks were identified in the RFP. I'm gonna summarize those uh, for the formation of an outreach plan. Task two was to facilitate the engagement process as defined in the outreach plan. Task three is to prepare and present the outcome report to the city council for review and recommendation and further investment of uh, resources. The evaluation criteria of those proposals did um, serve as three were recommended for a secondary interview process. Um, out of those firms, uh, the firm in front of you, which is Trepepe Smith, was the clear recommendation for council's consideration. The reasons for which are identified in the staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Um, I do wanna make a point of clarification in the RFP that's also attached that I understand there was some concern or discrepancy in the parcel maps that identified the city owned vacant lots that there was um, some concern over the acreage that was listed. Our planning and public work staff has identified that in our GIS system and we're trying to find out where that clerical error, not necessarily clerical, but the systems error that took place um, and we'll get that remedied. I just wanna make that point because the outcome of the RFP recommendation um, 
d is not affected by, by that. So um, the parcel maps were to provide additional context. Those are the city owned vacant lots that um, the city did acquisition. Uh, we also recognize, just to point out, the amount listed in the proposal um, that was provided uh, by the firm um, is different than the recommended appropriation amount. And that is based off of our discussion with the firm, as well as uh, some of the preliminary work that we know has already gone into it that was highlighted during that special work session in terms of the outreach that was conducted with our parks master plan, our bless master plan, and some other surveys and things that have been undertaken by our parks and rec commission. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and we do have representatives from Trepepe Smith joining us remotely tonight, uh, Ryder, Sydney, and Allie. Great. Thank you very much. Paul. I've, I've got a couple questions for you. Is the uh, discrepancy relative to the Heathercliff lot? There's, there's a few that uh, looks like the square footage is significantly less than it should be yeah, in that. terms of the acreage. The yeah. Triangle lot, the Chili Cook-Off lot, and I believe the Heather Cliff lot. And the, and the uh, pictures are, there's four of five, and uh, there is no five of five in my group. Is there a five of five? Does anybody have five of five? Ooh. That would be page number 358, I guess. But my 358 has an agreement for professional services. 353 is 505. 353 is 505. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Be it out of order. All right. Anything else, Paul? Uh, nope. I'm happy. Thank okay. you. Doug? Quick question. Uh, I don't see Bluffs Park or our existing parks being included in this study. I realize it's for vacant land. But wouldn't they have an impact on uh, what we decided to do with this land if, if we had uh, either expansion or better use? It, so the short answer is yes. As we understood the direction uh, from that meeting, uh, we will be presenting a list or gathering a list rather of the top facility priorities for the community to be presented to you as the council. Um, some of those uh, may be placed on the vacant lots, but as I understand your direction, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, was that there may be, for example, amenities at, say, Bluffs Park, uh, such as the ball fields that could be relocated to potentially one of the vacant lots because, say, it's better equipped to facilitate where a community center should be built or something of that nature. So the top priority list will have to have that next phase happen, which is the ultimate master plan or identity or identifying the lots where all amenities from this survey will go. Very good. And then uh, expected delivery date for this is when? Well, that is dependent on, so the first deliverable of the outreach plan um, is going to be driven majority by the, the city council and those community stakeholders that you deem that should be a part of that, perhaps some of our, our commissions and whatnot. So dependent on how in depth uh, you want to go with this plan, it can be as soon as six months. It could be as long as a year. And I only say that meaning it's going to be driven by how in-depth of the public process and public engagement you want to get with the formation of that plan. Okay, so are we going to be able to put some of the uh, projected expenses in this upcoming budget? Yes. I'm, and when I say expenses, I mean to do development for these projects. Right. Um, our, what we would say preliminary in the budget process is to allocate funds for the design and engineering of what these top, being that the top facility priorities are yet to be defined, but that those would go into a secondary consultant. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? Public speakers. Jake, you're up first. Do we have any hands? There's two hands. We'll come back. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, I just wanted to comment on this item and throw support behind the idea of developing city-owned vacant lots uh, into additional recreation facilities. Uh, the city fields and the high school swimming pool are beyond capacity. Uh, Little League, AYSO, MLS Go, and other organizations have been working together to try to juggle field space, and it's becoming more and more of a challenge. Um, Recreational facilities offer all the residents of Malibu the benefit of an active, healthy lifestyle, and I would, I think it would be something the community could fully support. 
Um, one idea that I wanted to throw out there was exploring a partnership with the YMCA. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever visited the Yarrow Family YMCA over in Westlake Village. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. They've got indoor fitness center, pool, basketball courts, cafe, pickleball courts, and then they have turf fields for baseball, softball, football, all kinds of um, outdoor activities. The YMCA offers classes to all age cohorts as well, um, including seniors, um, which I think would be a great benefit. Um, if you have time, it's worth checking out if you've never been over the hill and, and seen that facility. Um, I've said enough tonight. I just want to thank you all, the council, for all the work you do in the community and uh, helping to make this great town even better. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Jane, you're up. Joe, you're next. All right. Um, when I was asked to be on the Parks and Rec Commission, I did so with the intent of representing myself and a group of people who wish to see the community thrive and, and to have that community supported by the city government. The city, the city of Malibu has done an amazing job fulfilling the public's interest in open space. We truly have some of the most beautiful parks anywhere. I believe that there is more that can, can be done to provide the citizens with the infrastructure they desire, desire to lead happier, healthier lives. There is a critical lack of pool and field space in Malibu. Malibu does not own a pool. We lease a pool from SMM USD at very high rates. I've been on the commission for two years, the Parks and Rec Commission, and during that time, I believe the city has spent more than $200,000 on pool usage. For that cost, we have obtained very little time. The high school dominates the eight to five times during the week and many weekends, which causes citizens of Malibu to drive to neighboring cities, cities to use their facilities. My father drives multiple times a week to see me Valley to use their pool. In October 2022, the Parks and Rec Commission unanimously voted to pass a resolution to the city council which stated, the commission has reviewed options for a multi-generational recreational center with library services and a swimming pool using library set aside funds and the commission requests that the city look into the possibilities of adding these facilities at the Heather Cliff property. Since this resolution uh, and tours of this and other vacant spaces, the property at Heather Cliff and PCH remains the clear favorite of the commission for the pool and the community center. It, also, it is also clear that the large open space would accommodate several much needed playing fields with long walking path around its perimeter. Building this pool and community center would provide citizens of Malibu, both younger and older, the opportunities for athletic achievement, health, healthful exercise, and community bonding around activities that are essential to the culture of this great city. I urge the city to move deliberately to resolve the pool and field space issues and move forward as fast as possible with the community outreach. Thank you. And then I've got something from Alicia Peak here. Uh, dear City Council, my name is Alicia Peak, and I'm speaking as a Parks and Rec Commissioner this evening. I don't want to waste your time opposing, opposing the hiring of an outside consultant. However, for the record, I strongly oppose spending another $200,000 on this when nothing ever came from the last one. My commission has voted and has been asking for, asking for a pool for over a year. That, the last survey showed a giant need for an aquatics facility. However, this council insists that we must do the survey first. This is the point I want to hammer home tonight. How are you going to make sure that this is done right and something comes to fruition from the survey and the consultant? One, strict timelines need to be set by you. Six months max, not one year. Why pay someone else to do it if they can't do it expeditiously? Uh, one month to read the old surveys, two months to focus on groups and outreach, two months for surveys that need to be completed, one month to get the finding back in your hands. Time's up. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, Alicia says thanks. Thank All you right. guys very much. Joe, come on up. Thank you, Dan. Um, I agree that we should use the Heather Cl Cliff lot for a pool and, and community center, but I think instead of paying the consultant, we should pull the residents to see if that's something they want. Like just especially Point Doom residents, because I'm not sure they want any use of that land, just like the Trancus residents don't want, they want to keep that all open space. So I think we should just pull the residents or have a town hall or have, have some kind of a meeting with the residents, giving them that particular specific option for the Heathercliff lot, like, because we do need a pool. You can invite all the 
the the schools, the the baseball teams, the pool, the sea wolves, everybody to come and give their piece, and then I think you can have an answer. I don't think you need to spend one hundred thirty thousand dollars or whatever it is. So that's all I need to say. Thanks. Joe, thank you very much. Hands. First is Ryan. Ryan. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, thank the prior city council for taking advantage of the opportunity to purchase these lands when they became available and getting the financing lined up so that we could buy them at interest with certificates of participation or otherwise known as bonds and to keep them from turning into commercial shopping centers or uh, office buildings, which of course now would just be empty. And there was never an assumption <clears throat> that these um, land acquisitions would all become public parks. Um, we do have all these beaches in Malibu, by the way, but um, as an interim use, some of these lands could or should be used in that manner, but they're, they're open space. They were purchased with tax monies from private uh, ownership to kind of take them off uh, the market, so to speak. And one of the concepts was the city could privately deed restrict, put a conservation easement on some of these lands. Let's say you can't build higher than you know, one story, for instance, to preserve views or to reduce density of development and then resell them. And the city paid for highest and best use of appraised value for these properties. Um, they're <laughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars, and they can't all become, you know, recreational um, ball fields. I, I hate to have to say that, but that was not the original plan. And I understand that all of the senior staff at the city has cycled since these lands were acquired. So um, we have to go back and look at what is the intent? Why are we paying all this money and what's it for? And that these are not sunk costs of the city that um, we need to be able to be in a financial position to acquire more properties in the same fashion if necessary and have we have the opportunity. So um, I don't think it, Really, we need a whole nother survey says kind of a thing and to pit all the recreational users against each other for what they want to develop every square inch of every park everywhere. Um, I think it's up to the city council to decide. It does make sense to have a properly sized community center, uh, possibly with a second branch of the public library, and that it should be in the western part of Malibu and whether that's on the uh, Heathercliff property, or if the city should use its funding and, and uh, connections to try to obtain some additional parcel there on the other side of PCH at Heathercliff. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Any more hands? Josh Spiegel. Josh. Hey, everybody. I can't believe I'm up this late. Um, I have some comments, and then I'll try and finish off Alicia's if I have time. Um, Okay, I'm, it really sucks that we're back here. Um, after, I don't know when we did the last survey and nothing happened, but hey, I guess progress is progress. Um, couple, just one specific question. We, uh, by we, City of Malibu in closed session just made an agreement with the La Paz property. We're supposed to take this little, I think it's two acres back there, develop something and we get to keep it, right? I don't know what that word develop means. If that's just a coastal development permit, is that shovel in the ground? Is that CFO? I don't know what it is, but if somebody could answer that question, that would be awesome. I think we have six years to do it. We do the survey for that. We're not going to make it. I mean, that's ridiculous. We're just, this is not going to happen, especially if it's CFO. Anyway, um, I just lost my whole train of thought. Let me get to Alicia real quick. I'm going to hit the high points. Um, the survey needs to be property prop. This is uh, Alicia's words. So if there's bad words in here, it's not me. Uh, the survey needs to be property focused. What does each zoning property have an allow on it? 
um, an ad hoc committee or focus group needs to make um, made to work with the consultants throughout the process with rec facilities and performing arts at the forefront. This is not an outreach to find what people want in Malibu. This is a survey to focus on what facilities go where. Again, this is what um, all of you want. So please learn from the past surveys and make sure this one is timely, property focused, and has built in community support and is property focused. We need rec facilities. Um, wow, three minutes really is a lot longer than I thought it was. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other hands? Those are all the raised hands. Okay, back to the public comments closed, back to the council table. Speak. Anybody? Paul? Hi, I, I just want to take a moment to address Ryan's concerns that uh, we, we uh, are going to spend money on building parks and not have money for getting more land. And I've got to tell you that the best way we could uh, could possibly get more money for buying land is to actually do something with the parks that with the land we already bought. Uh, I know that there is a group of very wealthy people who are setting up a 501c3 with the idea of being ready to fund the pool and the rec center that they're talking about on Point Doom. And that is something that you will find people more than willing to go to fundraisers, open their checkbooks. They want it. They're willing to pay for it. It would benefit the entire community. And when the time came for us to acquire something else, you would find that they would be very helpful with that as well. So let's utilize that resource by, by going forward with this. I think it's a great idea. I'm sorry it's taken this long. When I first ran for office, I was talking about we have to hold these hearings. We have to move forward on this. I, I can't wait to do this. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, the um, idea of doing a survey, I've looked at the report, I think it's 2014 or so. Uh, things have changed somewhat since then. We've got uh, people play pickleball now. Pickleball was in somebody's uh, uh, back of mind in 2014. So we have other uses that come along. It's really just a chance to bring this up to date. We'd be remiss if we didn't try and, and do that before we spent money on uh, putting facilities in place. And Paul is right. There's people that want to spend money uh, or really to raise money and spend it on uh, projects here for just naming rights. That's what it really comes down to, or a chance to improve the city. So I think it's great that we look at that as an alternative. Also on the La Paz land, uh, we do have time to uh, uh, develop that it's actually owned by the city now thanks to the uh, uh, deal we made with low pause I'm ready to make a motion to approve Bruce want to say anything uh, you know it's just to follow up on Doug's point earlier about I think it was Doug about bluffs park I mean it, it does seem to me that this overall um, inquiry should in, should include that property because it's in the mix and it also should give consideration to the fact that we have $22 million in the library fund to do development of either the existing library or, depending on what might be worked out with the county, a, an alternative additional site. And it could be, again, a modern, a modern facility that would be a community center. So we might be able to kill two birds with one stone there in terms of a community center that the city needs and not have to spend additional dollars out of the city's treasury because we have already contributed it to the library fund. So I, I just wonder whether those other two parcels should be included, or those other two concepts should be included in this uh, project. Uh, Councilor, absolutely. So that would be uh, a point that we could raise during the formation of the outreach plan. Um, it's not limited to, I understand, obviously, the proposal itself with city-owned vacant lots, um, but we really are identifying the top priorities that could go on any potential facilities within the city of Malibu, and so we would include that as part of the strategy. Okay. Anybody else? Paul? I want no part of any study about taking existing parks and transforming them into something else. We have, we have a lot of vacant land we can deal with, but my experience is that as soon as you take something away with the thought that we're gonna be able to replace it with something else quickly, 
It doesn't work out to be quickly. People get very irritated. I don't want anything part of that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Marianne. Okay. Um, so I agree with some of the other speakers from the community and some of the council members um, that we've already done studies. We have the Parks and Rec Master Plan from 2012. We have the R General Plan that was written in 1993 uh, that shows that we were deficient at that time for recreational facilities. Um, LA County Parks did a plan um, with community input a few years ago. I don't see Kristen here, she'd probably help with that. Um, when there was talk about the Bluffs Park swap between Bluffs and Charmley, there were studies that were done about requirement of facilities and things that the community want. We know the community wants a swimming pool. We know they want more field, multi-purpose field space. We know they want a community center. We know that they want to have uh, community gathering areas. We know they want some type of arts and performing center, some place to gather to watch movies and other multi-arts um, facility. Um, what we need to do is figure out where we're going to put these places. Um, I would disagree with comments from the public with regards that these lands were purchased to be just vacant or uh, take them off commercial space. My recollection in 2018 when these lands were purchased, it was in response to the Bluffs Park swap and the identification that we needed additional land in order to make the deficiencies in our recreational opportunities a reality. Um, so I think it's important that we keep a timeline of less than six months for the community outreach for the determination on what goes where, not if we should do something, but what is the best use of that particular lo lot and what the community wants with it. Um, to Joe's comment about the public outreach, that's the whole purpose of this, is to facilitate the public outreach. So this company is going to perform that public outreach, so we get that. So we have to approve this in order to facilitate that next step. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive. This is one of my passions. This is one of the things I want to see get done. We need a community swimming pool for from cradle to grave. We need everybody wants to swim. It's a, an important activity for our community. They want it. We need more field space. We don't have enough. Every single sport is impacted by not having enough of that. And we need performing arts and a place for gathering um, to enjoy those these items. So let's get this done. Let's get this moving so we can start constructing these as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Yeah. So two comments. One is, first of all, I, you know, I grew up on the East Coast in two different, well, in a large city and then a smaller, relatively large city. Uh, you know, you could walk to a baseball field, a basketball court, tennis court, um, sometimes a swimming pool, almost anywhere you lived, because that's what those large cities provided. And as much as we're a rural place, those are great things for the, those are great things for the community. In fact, thinking about the fact that we charge for our fields, I, maybe those cities charge for the fields, I don't remember it. I thought we just went and organized sporting events and used the fields as we wished, and I don't think anybody ever charged for anything like that. Um, so we, we definitely need these things. Um, the community deserves these things. I think the consultants are an unfortunately needed, they're a necessary evil. We, we, we need to do this in a robust, proper way, which is why I'm going to support this. By the way, was there a second? Because if there wasn't, I'll second the motion. I'll second the motion. Um, we all have anecdotal information about what the so-called community wants. We all know what the loudest voices we hear from want. If you come to these meetings on a regular basis, there's 10 people that routinely tell us what the community wants, but that's what those 10 people want. So we really do need to understand what the majority of our 8,000 or 10,000 residents truly want. And the only way we can find that out, because they're not gonna come talk at a meeting, they're not gonna even come to little town halls. The only way to do it is outreach. I'm, not, I'm still not sure how the outreach is going to work. I assume that's gonna be worked out. I think Marianne ought to be part of that process in making sure that it gets done right. But we really need to know what everyone truly wants, not just what the loudest voices say they want. Anybody else? I would just say, the one thing I forgot to say is that I think our um, Parks and Rec and our Arts and possibly even a Planning Commissioner should be included in that 
so that we get that um, complete uh, community overview of okay. necessary items. Okay, I, I want to just play off what Bruce said. Uh, when I read the report, the staff report, it, it got a whole bunch of stuff we're going to do. We're going to do surveys, we're going to do ads, we're going to do da 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 da. But nobody says exactly what kind of data we have to gather to be able to make a good decision, all right? I mean, it, the deal says, at least, and I haven't, you look at it and you say, I want to make sure I touch on all the necessary demographic groups, because the people who are 70 years old may need something different than the people who are 15. I mean, so are, what are they going to do to make sure they've touched base with all those people? How many, how many people do they think they have to talk to to get a good perspective of what the city wants? I, I mean, I can't find any of that in this report someplace. And I just think some of that information we ought to know before they set out because I want to make sure when we get to the end of this, we've gathered the right information, we've got all the data we need so we can move forward versus going back and arguing about who said what or what it means. It's, if, if I can, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to um, request the consultants who are on the line to weigh in on that. Yeah, please do. Good evening, Alexis. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Phenomenal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor, for that question. Uh, this is Ryder Smith speaking with Trapepe Smith. I'm co-founder of the firm and president. So uh, first thing I would just clarify um, is that, and you raise a, a wonderfully valid point, I agree, we want to identify the kind of information we want to gather before we go on the quest to gather it. Um, to that point, the intention is to, uh, on approve, if approved by council tonight, is to take this plan or to go develop a plan in collaboration with staff and with guidance from um, city council to make sure we're very clear about what we're going to go execute to achieve the kind of feedback you're seeking. And I would agree with the point about um, uh, understanding what those metrics are, making sure we're cognizant of all the key demographics in the community and the various stakeholder groups that are going to be important to this process, um, and to ensure that we're reading, reaching beyond uh, to all the different voices in the community um, that are, you know, from around the various constituencies and giving everybody a, a great opportunity to participate in the conversation and process. Okay, so you're going to come back with a plan before you start this stuff. We're going to come back with a plan that says, here's how we're going to go back and, and, and contact the, the residents. Here's how many we're going to talk to. Here's how we're going to make sure we get all the demographics covered. Here's how we're making sure that what we're building sort of agrees with what our future demographics and mail we're going to look like. So we've got something that really we can layer, you know, sit down with somebody and say, we've really done a good job and we're making sure we've got what you need. So if that we is, can do that, I'll be happy. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the quick answer there is we not only plan on coming up with a plan, uh, but then part of our engagement here is actually to uh, provide a report to council that would actually identify all the outreach work that was done, participation we had in those projects to make sure you have a thorough accounting for the level of effort that was put into and the success achieved in reaching uh, a broad swath of the community. Alexis? Just to, to add to that comment um, from Ryder, thank you. Uh, in, in the deliverables that are defined in Trapepi's proposal, uh, what you find there is the, the formation of the outreach plan as part of task one. In addition, they also proposed splitting task one out and created a task two, which is the conversational toolkit. So as part of that outreach, de the development of the outreach plan, which would consist of members of the city council, and then as council member Riggins said, is to include parks and rec commission members, planning commission members, arts and culture um, as, as a stakeholder group that would also kind of form this, this plan. Um, from that, Trapepi would then develop the conversational toolkit, which is how it would be um, facilitate, which is how we would facilitate the engagement process and, and begin to disseminate that information. But you all have a hand in that prior to it going out to the community, so you know how it's going to be cool. communicated. Excellent. All right, any other comments? We got a measure motion in a second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? So ordered. All right, moving along. Just get it done quickly. It's after 10.30, we need to- 6F. Uh, I want to go on and hear 6F, 6E, sorry. We need a vote. I'll make a motion to hear item 6E. Roll call, please, Kelsey. A second. Is that a second from Council Member Grisanti? A second. I'll second. Okay. Council Member Riggins. Miss Mike. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Council Member Grisanti. Yes. 
Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, Melba Farmers Market. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, we are going to provide a update to you on the Malibu Farmers Market since our last meeting on January 8th where the item was continued. Um, since January 8th, uh, the um, staff has been working in partnership with the County of Los Angeles and Cornucopia Foundation, uh, working to ensure a smooth and swift transition from Legacy Park back to the County Santa Monica College property. On February 6th, um, a motion uh, put forward by Supervisor Horvath uh, was granted by the Board of Supervisors to grant Cornucopia a fee waiver um, in regards to the day use permits um, for a period of a uh, couple months uh, through April of 2024. Uh, during this time, the county will evaluate Cornucopia's operations of the farmer's market uh, prior to uh, granting a two-year license agreement. Um, a copy of that motion is in your agenda packet. Uh, this same motion uh, was passed back in September 26, but it did have a sunset date of January 31st. That's why it was back in front of the Board of Supervisors. Um, also, since then, we had, we had talked about that the county was waiting on some information and paperwork uh, by the organization. Um, the organization has fulfilled that. Um, that paperwork did include two years of financials, uh, proof of their nonprofit status, a certified farmer's market uh, certificate is what it is. It's provided through the California Department of Food and Agriculture vendor list, as well as vendor application information, and then a certificate of liability that names the county as a, and the city of Malibu is additionally insured. Um, all of these have been provided. Um, also, the uh, city has been in receipt of the site map, also included as attachment three in your packet, um, with the appropriate designation of 65%, um, 35% linear square footage uh, for uh, in accordance with our current CUP guidelines. Um, we are, uh, our planning department's been in review of the map, um, and, it, and it does meet that, however, we just, need everyone to understand that an amendment of the CEP is going to be required. Cornucopia understands that, the county understands that, um, but since we're all in agreement that this uh, does work and showcase with their vendor list and, it, and we did go ahead and reconcile both of those um, to match that they will be able, as of today, uh, received the authorization to move back to the county starting this Sunday. Have they got all the insurance stuff in? I saw that today. Correct. Very good. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'll stand for any questions that you have. There are still a few elements as I, uh, that need to get worked out. For example, um, the, the parking, um, but we're, we're still in um, conversations and working with the real estate office at the county and Supervisor Horvath's office and Cornucopia and just trying to, to move through this. Gotcha. Questions? Paul? I don't have any questions. Anybody? Uh, cool. Uh, we got do we need a motion? What do we do? Uh, Mayor, public if you're comment. ready for public comment. Uh, public comment, I'm sorry. I, I believe we have one in-person okay. speaker. Yes, I'm sorry. Trying to move us along. Hi. Um, I've been working with the Parks and Rec Department. I'm on the ad, ad hoc subcommittee for, you know, essentially what is um, working towards a fair bid process for recreational activities in Malibu. And since then, it's made me think about the, these contracts that the city gets involved with in general. And um, I'm looking at this uh, situation that we've got at the farmer's market, and I'm trying to, to get an idea from the council of when the last time this bid from this contractor has been evaluated. Um, I've been approached by several other businesses that are interested in running a farmer's market in Malibu. Uh, local businesses that that I think might do a great job and I want to take an opportunity to say that before we agree to any long-term contracts with this current vendor that 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 the city of Malibu should evaluate potential bids for that position and that that this this person that's running that market isn't the only person that's in the space and that's all I've got okay, thank you yeah thanks anybody Paul Mayor, if yeah. we can just note quickly, we don't have any raised hands on Zoom, so that is the end of public comment. Okay, close public comment. Any comments from up here? I, th I think what we have in front of us is a two-year commitment 
on the basis of they're going to have two years there to do well or, or not. And I would love to see us proceed with this and get this over with. We've been tortured with this ever since September, I think, and I'd like it to move on. So, tortured may be this are strong, we, but okay. are we actually approving anything? No, I don't, I don't think we are. Are we? What are we approving? No, just uh, we do ask for a direction um, as we go through the CUP amendment. Um, if there's any considerations we need to give for that, but otherwise, there's no official direction by the city or action by the city council. Comments? I've got the the comment. council doesn't define the, the CUP. They apply for that. Yeah. yeah. So. So we shouldn't weigh in on the the, the, the CUP. Are we, I do apologize. You're talking about the application coming to the, the city to amend the CUP. Yes, I apologize. Let me clarify. In, re in regards to the parking issue would be the only topic of discussion that we would ask for direction for this evening. So, so on this question of who runs the farmer's market, I mean, we're, we're not approving anything. We're not locked into any contracts. So I'm not sure we even have a contract. Is that right? Correct. The county is the license holder and issues the license for the farmer's market. The, the city's involvement in this scenario is purely because of the CUP on the county's property that allows for the use uh, for the event. The, the county will be the holder of the CUP, but the, the uh, Participate Cornucopia will be pushing the application forward. Okay. And so, so just, um, just to be clear, the, the agenda just says receive and file a, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Review the proposed, oh, provide staff directions. Okay. So I apologize. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, Dane, I think you're absolutely correct. Anything that had to do with the city's uh, uh, contracting with somebody should be out for an RFP. But as I think was just said, we don't have anything to do with this. Uh, there was discussions last time around, I think it was, that if we were going to put this on uh, city property, then it definitely needed to go out for an RFP. Um, I think that perhaps uh, moved it along a little bit more. But uh, at the end of the day, I agree with uh, Paul. We've looked at this long enough, and it's not even, it's not even a, a business we're associated with. It's just a CUP. We're just trying to be helpful for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, so, Mayor, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm confused, though. What are we giving direction about specifically? So the, the staff report was was for the January 8th when several options were presented to you should we want to move the market away from the county property. But since then, there's been a resolution found. The only outstanding item that uh, we've been able to come to somewhat of an agreement that's within the existing CUP framework uh, that we would ask for any direction on uh, would be for the parking related to the event itself. Um, we have confirmed um, and the prior, the existing CUP called for on-site parking. Obviously with the reconfiguration of the booth spaces that does eliminate the use of the lower lot for on-site parking. Um, that's about 88 spaces. Uh, there, since the CUP was adopted back in 2009, the improvements to Legacy Park were done, um, which does allow for street parking. Uh, that's 148 spaces. Um, and then just a brief legislative history, council did adopt a, an ordinance that allowed for the um, parking on the Ioki lot by way of obtaining a temporary use permit. Right. So that was the only part if there should be any direction for that or just to move forward and continue to work with the county as is. So my suggestion is get them over to the parking lot. Let's see how that works out. And once we get that done, we can figure out if, if we need more parking or how we address that thing. Yeah. I think the first step says, Let's get the major thing done first, and then we can pick up any pieces. Well, is the, is the CUP going to mandate that the parking be on site, or it will just be silent as to parking? Yeah. Basically, the CUP, when the, when CUP the C should only really cover the change in the uh, configuration on the parking lot, right? Everything else. Right. So, so we really don't have to give any direction. We have to, just know, other, other than, than saying, let's continue just, moving forward. Let's just yeah, they, keep moving forward and see where it goes. They need to submit the application, and then if, if, if there's a consideration with the Planning Commission that the parking's insufficient or needs any adjustments, it would be for them to take the first step at that. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Go ahead. Marianne? So uh, thank you, Alexis, for that update that those improvements, um, that that area has had additional parking added to it. Um, but my understanding is no matter what, the cornucopia will have to come back for an amendment because 
their size has increased of the farmer's market from when the original CUP was done and that's why there's not sufficient parking or? No, I don't think that. No, they will have to come back for an amendment to the CUP because of the reconfiguration of the booths. Um, the parking that is now being on site is required by the county for access to the library. So the configuration does not allow for the on-site parking, the lower lot in that map that you see on attachment three. And so that is what's going to trigger because of that reconfiguration, uh, the CUP amendment. Um, what may be required, and we won't know this until the application comes forward uh, with that official CUP amendment, is if they are going to increase in size. I can say that the, the map in front of you is working within the framework of 108 10 by 10 booth spaces. They're just reallocated. We understand that they do want to grow, but that's going to be under review when that comes to our planning department. Okay. So... Um I've had some trouble with the compliance of the farmer's market to the rules of the city. They were given a temporary use permit to use Legacy Park as a stopgap, and they continue to use that well past what this council approved them to be. Um, what kind of things are we doing to ensure that they submit their CUP application within a timely manner, and that, that um, any deficiencies in that application are responded to by Cornucopia in a timely manner. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if Richard can, can weigh in here, but we would be requesting that we enter into a compliance agreement in the interim. Yes, as mentioned in the agenda report, the plan would be to enter into a compliance agreement with both the county and Cornucopia. And we would be looking for a CUP application. The county would be part of that is the plan since they are the ones who are allowing the farmer's market on their property and they hold the, um, and I'm sorry, I forget the name of the agreement. The license agreement. the license agreement with the farmer's market. So the compliance agreement would have a timeline for them to essentially come in, make an application, uh, put in requirements, performance requirements that they respond to us within X amount of days and then limit the term for which they could operate while we are processing this application. The goal is compliance uh, and having some sort of boundaries on them while we go through this uh, process of getting a CUP amendment before the Planning Commission. Okay. And then what's the status of their outstanding um, penalties for use of Legacy Park without a permit? Um, they have not filed an appeal for that. Uh, we are in review of that with our uh, city attorney just as to some procedural um, clarification. Um, but otherwise, the, the citations and the fees incurred still stand. Uh, it's just under about $10,000. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I have two more questions. Um, one is under the new configuration where they're required to not utilize for for the farmers market itself the um, upper right quadrant of the parking lot the part closest to the library uh, is there a restriction on the public parking in there while the farmers market's operating or is that just has to be left open from booths my understanding is the latter so the public can park there um, the the intent yes the in, the enforcement uh, would be on the county as to that. I'm I'm not sure how they plan if they intend to notice it as library business only or what have you. That's that's within there. We haven't received any word how they plan to to delineate that from the market itself. As of right now, it's just public parking that's available for anybody going to the library or going to the farmers market. Yeah, the county wanted to keep it open for the library. They expect people showing up there Sunday, so right. we'll see. Okay. The other question I have is the. Um, the various diagrams we have show certain booths are supposed to be certified farmers, some are non-certified pre-packaged, some are non-certified crafted and pre-made. Do we have any involvement with that or is that just between the, the um, county and the farmer's market? Uh, the involvement, our sole involvement will be that it is a condition of our CUP, the 65%, 35% as to um, identifying those outside of that. That's with the environment or the public health department with the county. Um, they do require when they uh, 
obtain their temporary food facility permits that those vendors that are certified uh, show that they are certified producers with the state Department of Food and Ag, but otherwise just ensuring that um, they do properly display that it is um, within that 65, 35% of total linear feet. Um, we do in our CUP currently have quarterly inspections um, okay. that where we, we do go out and ensure that they're in compliance of that. Okay. And to follow up to Alexis's comments, the Planning Commission, when we heard the item in Old City Hall, there was the concern that the farmer's market would turn into a flea market and at the time compete with the Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, Lions Club, and, and there was that concern. So that is why the city, when it issued the CUP, put those requirements for a certain mix of vendors. Thanks. Okay, hey, Paul. Uh, I, I, we're talking about parking also, and for some reason the parking behind the college is not on offer, as I understand it. Uh, there's a substantial parking lot behind the college. Uh, the, and of course we own the, the lot next door, and we have in the past allowed them to utilize it for parking as well. But I, I don't, I guess we'll see if a parking problem develops right, and then we can deal with it. I think I agree. Anybody else? Do we need a, do we have a motion? What's the motion? We don't need a motion. Need a motion. All right. Well, then I think we're all, and I don't answer a roll call, so we're, you don't need to do anything. We're done. Yes? Do you feel directed? Cool. Thank you. Okay. We went, it's 1050. 6F. 6F. We, need a vote. we need a vote, guys. 6F. What's 6F? I, 6F was part of the supplement you got. I'm, a, I'm inclined to go home. That was 6E. You got two items you take back out. I don't have 6F. You have this one and seven, eight. Am I the only person that has six F? No, no, we, no. we have six F, seven A, and seven B, but we need to vote each time on whether to continue, yeah. and we need a two thirds vote. And um, none of these are, are, he, are heavy items. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, let's they're just not clear critical. our skit or. I'm, yeah. I'm inclined to let them slide to another meeting. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could, um, 6F is really just to receive and file on a strategic plan. Um, certainly, if there, were, if there were questions or comments, we could hold that. To a future meeting, um, and then the uh, the designation of the voting delegates that that should be pretty quick, but it, it, that's not timely for this evening. Can we can we do six F without a presentation? Just we already have it in the packet, or do we need to sit and have a presentation? You do not. The council does not need to sit and have a presentation from your city manager. The the report I think speaks for itself, and we're making good progress. Mayor, if I could just make a couple points for the council's consideration, um, the council will need to hear any public comment for any items that are called, um, okay. and then also. Item 7A, although it doesn't seem time sensitive, SCAG is asking us to inform them who our voting delegates are as soon as possible. So if the council could hear that tonight, it would be helpful. Let's do 7A. Okay. And we're going to move 6F no. to the next meeting? Yeah, 6F to the next meeting and the other item to the next meeting. And by the way, I would like a presentation on 6F. I, I would yeah, also. Yeah, I do too. Uh, yeah, I agree. So, so can we take a formal vote? I'll make a motion. A motion this year. for 7A. 7A only. I need a vote. I'll make a motion. Motion. Second. 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 Oh, roll call, please. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Sure. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Ewing? Yes. Motion carries. I'm happy to volunteer for. Is, is there any public comment? <laughs> we do not have any speaker slips for this item. Um, and we had one raise hand, but it was just lowered. So you don't have any speakers cool. for item 7A. Oh, I'm sorry, they just raised their hand again, if you could hear them. Jamie Francis. Jamie. Are, are they going to be hearing for 6F or is that postponed it's for postponed. another meeting? Another meeting. Okay, then I'll, I'll call back when it's, it's heard at the next meeting then. Thank very you. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, we get. So, how do we, we make the right decision? Right. Do we need one <laughs> delegate, two delegates? What do we need here? We, we do need one primary and one alternate. I'll volunteer to be the primary. Anybody want to be an alternate? I volunteer to be the alternate. I, I would like to make a motion oh. that these two become their primary and alternate. Mayor, before you make the motion, if I can just note, we don't have any speaker slips for this right. item. Oh, I'm sorry, we already did that. You did that, yeah. yeah. I'll second that motion. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? None, so it's so ordered. Let's adjourn. In the name of? In the Wait. name of?
Matt Rath. What are we doing with 7B? The next meeting. Okay. All right, so we're adjourning in the, with uh, in Matt, Rath. Matt Rath, right? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. See you next, see you two weeks. <laughs>